Scream if you want to go faster. Can you give me what? Can you give me a time? Uh, 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 yeah. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, for the benefit of YouTube viewers, members of the Safer, Stronger Communities Overview and Scrutiny Subcommittee are present in the committee chamber at County Hall, Beverly. Uh, many officers have also joined us, which is great. Thank you very much for coming. Can you please ensure your mobile phone is turned to silent? If the fire alarm sounds, please exit the room via the fire doors, which will be signposted by the committee manager. And please remember to turn your mic off when you're not using it. And, okay, um, Councillor Jeffries. Yes, there she is. She's with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Um, make sure that you let, let us know if you want to say something, which I'm sure you will. Um, so thank you very much. So we'll start with item one, which is declarations. Have any members got any declarations they wish to state? No? So can we look at the minutes? Um, can we approve the minutes as a correct record of the meeting of the 18th of January? Yeah. Councillor Sarable. I was present in the previous meeting, and can we please correct the minutes from the yes. 18th January meeting? Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was, yeah, thank you. Um, any, other, any other things that are written in incorrectly that anybody's picked up? Okay. Thank you very much. So we'll have to do that. So if we go to item number three, which is the taxi and private hire services in the East Riding. So which of our portfolio holds, Councillor Hammond, would you like to introduce this, please? Thank you, Chair, and good morning, committee. Um, you've also got the report in front of you, so I'll just say a few things, and I'm going to hand over to Louise Wilson, our licensing manager, who's got a PowerPoint presentation to take you through the report in a bit more detail. As you can see, uh, we take our responsibilities, our statutory responsibilities at a licensing authority very seriously in these riding, and the, the main at the front of that is protecting the public, and also in this case, I'd say as well, looking after good taxi drivers and license holders. And we do a number of schemes, to do that, uh, one that comes to mind to me all the time is we provide free CCTV to our license holders' taxis, which I think is a great initiative to protect the public and the drivers. Um, we take the rules extremely seriously and we will take action on complaints. We make sure that those rules are enforced. And any of you who are on the licensing committee, as I used to be, will see that it is not uncommon for us to suspend or, or revoke licenses where drivers are not protecting the public. Um, the report highlights a number of issues the sector is currently facing. I think the main one is the ageing population of our drivers in the East Riding. Uh, it seems to be not something that young people are, are going into en masse, but we are launching a media campaign, which is now up and running already, based off of case studies of current drivers to try and show people that it is a good profession to get into. It can be quite a flexible profession, especially if you're self-employed. It's good to work alongside another job or alongside family commitments. So it is a good job to be in. And, and of course, there is a demand for transport across the East Riding. So I'll now hand over to Louise. He'll take you through the PowerPoint presentation and the more detail of the report. Then we'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, so before you today, we have um, a report in relation to the taxi and private hire services in the East Riding. Um, and we thought what we'd do is just take you with an overview of what's in the report. So as you can see, that we're looking at the previous and future challenges that face um, the industry and the licensing authority together. So as of today, we actually have 291 licensed drivers, 89 hackney carriage vehicles and 155 private hire vehicles and 65 licensed private hire operators in our area. 
As you can see from your report, this is actually an increase since the report was written, which is very good news for the industry in this area. A future challenge that is coming our way and requires planning at this time is the aging demographic of our licensed drivers. Currently, we have 52 drivers over the age of 65, with a further 95 drivers over the age of 50. This equates to over 50% of the entire licensed trade. This is a documented national issue, with the number of licensed vehicles and drivers across the country are decreasing, um, but, and they've not recovered to the pre-pandemic levels in 2019. But on top of this, there is also a substantial drop in the number of those drivers who may look to retire in the not-too-distant future. So as a service, we've been looking for new ways to encourage new people into that industry. And as mentioned by Councillor Hammond, we have launched a, a, um, a publicity campaign looking at case studies from real licensed drivers in our area, telling other people about why they enjoy the profession so much, how it works well for them, where they've built a business within the profession and how it can be a very successful career. So we intend to put those out through social media channels to encourage people on a regular basis to look at those and consider whether it may be an option for them. This is very early days, so time will tell as to whether this does encourage people into the trade, um, but we hope that using some sort of new ideas and promoting those areas might have a positive impact. The demand for private hire and hackney carriages has remained lower than the pre-pandemic levels, and this has been heavily linked to the cost of living crisis. However, the trade are now reporting that there is slow movement towards recovery, but we are monitoring those provisions within the East Riding, and in particular, we're monitoring the provisions within the nighttime economy currently. An issue that is affecting many areas across the country at the moment is cost cross-district vehicles. The law does permit for these vehicles to be licensed far afield and to work anywhere within England or Wales. Um, however, this, this obviously has been exasperated by the um, fast-moving pace of mobile booking apps, which do mean that an operator can be based anywhere and dispatch a vehicle within seconds to somebody within that district. So no vehicles no longer therefore need to be anywhere near that booking office to accept that booking and to pick up passengers at their convenience. This unfortunately has been exploited in some areas of the country and those vehicles have been licensed substantial distances from their licensing authorities, which does impact on the ability of other licensing authorities to take enforcement and compliance action where necessary. The Department for Transport recently updated their guidance in November of 2023, and as part of that update, they did state that licensing authorities should be asking drivers at the point of application where they intend to work once licensed, and also consideration should be given to the residential address of that applicant at the time. Um, here in the East Riding, we have had an intended use policy in place for our Hackney carriages for some years, and that is a consideration when we look to grant those that they are going to provide a provision here in the East Riding. So in 2020, the government introduced national private hire and hackney carriage vehicle standards. These are statutory standards and they came in across the whole of England and Wales. The standards came in to affect and standardise all of licensing authorities' approaches to the licensing standards and setting minimum requirements across the board. The East Riding was very well placed when these came into effect and many of the national standards we'd already met through our licensing policy and therefore we only required very minimal changes at that time. Some of those changes included a move from 12 monthly checks to six monthly checks on police checks online and a increased focus on ensuring the public understand the difference between the types of licensed vehicles and ensuring that the information is out there to keep themselves safe when they're in the nighttime economy or using any means of public transport. The National Standards also set out amendments to the licensing policy that when we apply an amendment for any future that those should therefore be applied retrospectively to everybody already in the licensed trade. What that did was effectively remove any grandfather rights from anybody already licensed to ensure that it was always an even playing field moving forward. They also focused on showing that um, people knew how to recognise licensed vehicles and that those could tie into the campaigns already here in the East Riding. When the DFT, uh, sorry, when the Department of Transport updated its guidance again recently in November, it expanded on those national standards and aimed to close the gaps where the legislation has become very outdated. However, this most recent guidance is not statutory guidance, and therefore, although it needs to be fully considered and its impacts looked at for the East Riding, it is not necessarily that every licensing authority will take those new updated guidance from the transport on board. The most updated guidance does focus on the licensing authorities looking at integrating taxis into the local transport plans, 
ensuring that there is increased accessibility for all, including the introduction of an inclusive service plan for taxi and private hire services in the local area. And the consideration of looking at matters like age restrictions on licensed vehicles, vehicle emissions, and as mentioned, the intention of where the drivers want to work once you've granted them a license. So work is currently underway here in the East Riding to look at all aspects of that updated guidance, um, giving full weight to the public safety and accessibility while being aware of the potential impacts further requirements could have on the licensing trade who are already trying to recover. We do seek to build up the trade while we ensure that we can protect the residents and visitors to the East Riding. The future challenges currently facing the trade are the cost to purchase vehicles, including very high insurance premiums, which have all come following the pandemic's impact. Thank you. So here we're just going to touch on some of the things that the um, licensing authority do to ensure that we are providing public safety and um, educating the public in relation to their safety. So the licensing authority has a statutory duty to undertake rigorous checks on applicants and existing license holders to ensure that every single person in the system is deemed to be safe and suitable or fit and proper to be granted a license and therefore, in return, protect the traveling public. The licensed driver's role is of great responsibility and therefore rigorous checks are undertaken, which include checks on DVLA licenses, um, criminal records looking at DBSs and um, medical assessments. And following the national standards, we also now undertake internal checks with our colleagues in antisocial behavior, domestic violence, children and adult safeguarding teams, to ensure that the council holds no information on individuals that may um, question whether they are safe and suitable to hold such a role. We also undertake what is called an NAR3 check, which is a national database of which every licensing authority is ma now mandated to enter details of any license they've ever suspended, revoked or refused to renew. Those checks are done at the point of application to ensure anybody coming into the system has not had a license revoked or removed in another area across the country. We've also introduced a mandatory CCTV scheme. This was off the back of a voluntary scheme, which was very successful. And in line with the national standards, it, which encourage mandatory schemes, all licensed vehicles now have to be fitted with a CCTV system that records um, internally throughout the whole vehicle, has a forward facing dash camera, and also has audio recording that is instigated by an emergency button available to both the passengers and the driver within the vehicle. To date, 214 of our licensed vehicles have that new system installed. And in the very short time that they've been up and running, this has already proved very useful here in the, the East Riding. We've had eight downloads of matters for such as assault on the drivers, assaults that have happened outside of the vehicle, accidents and criminal damage. And since writing this report, we've had a further two downloads from the last weekend, which unfortunately were assaults on licensed drivers. We have devised and we do continue to update a bespoke safeguarding training session here for all our drivers, which educates the drivers on matters such as child, criminal and sexual exploitation, modern day slavery um, and violence against women and girls, along with all other general vulnerabilities for members of the public. We teach the drivers how they can support in that fight against such behaviours and how learning about what they can see and hear and knowing how to report those concerns to the most appropriate services. We also continue to run and promote a Will You Get Home Safe Tonight campaign, which has been running now for over 10 years. This informs the public about how to recognise licensed vehicles and licensed drivers and how to ensure that they're not tempted to pick up a vehicle that's not fit for purpose or to accept a ride through means such as social media that hasn't been through these checks to ensure that their safety is of the paramount concern. Um, We've also worked with our partners in transport services since 2014 now to ensure that the same level of vetting is in place for all drivers who apply for a contract on behalf of the local education authority or to transport the vulnerable adults across the East Riding. Licensing is also now a key partner in the council's nighttime economy strategic group, which is focusing on protecting people using the nighttime economy and having safe nights out. And the taxes will form an integral part of getting people home and safe from those nights out. And lastly, the legislation behind hackney carriage and private hire licensing is very outdated 
some of the licensing in relation to Hackney Carriage dates back to 1847 and 1976 in relation to private hire vehicles, which therefore has resulted in many changes to guidance, introductions of national standards, introductions of secondary legislation, which are all listed under section um, 1.12 of your report today. And these all place additional requirements on either the licensing authority or the licensed trade to ensure that the standards are being met and they're relevant and where relevant to these riding we have some discretion exists. This will remain a, a challenge to balance the needs between ensuring the impacts do not adverse, adversely affect the provisions of the trade, who do play a very important role in protecting the most vulnerable members of our society and providing public transport, and ensuring that we can grow that trade to ensure its future-proof provision for the East Riding. We need to work with the trade to see how we can they can be supported without reducing any of the essential criteria to protect the public and to safeguard vulnerable individuals. Uh, myself and Tina Holtby, Group Manager, are also here today if you've got any questions you'd like to ask. But thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, for that. Um, I'd just like to, um, I, I just wonder whether maybe Tina could give us a, an idea of what, what, what breaches, what is the most common breach that comes before, before you or that you pick up on? I don't see many of the breaches now, Councillor Holtby. Um, I'll leave that to Louise as the licensing manager. But most of the ones that we get appeals for, um, which I am involved with, are where a driver's had the license either suspended or a warning issued, and they want to appeal against that decision. I think in terms of um, breaches tend to be driving offences. I'm looking at Louise, they tend to be driving offences now. I mean, we've gone past the days where um, we have got a very good licensed trade. Many years ago, we were in the position where we were revoking licences um, several times a year for public safety issues. The CCTV has made a significant difference and the livery in terms of recognising our, our vehicles. Um, so I'm pleased to say that I don't see as many appeals now as I used to. Councillor Smith. Thank you. Um, I would just like to thank you for that report. Uh, I would also take this, like to take this opportunity to encourage any members to go through licensing training because what I learned in that process is invaluable. Um, a couple of points I'd like to raise if possible. We talk about protecting the public within the Hackney carriage vehicle itself. We have a swivel chair, and this is something that's come up a few times with people. I'm trying to understand um, the benefits of that chair against the risks, because my understanding through talking to the drivers who operate these vehicles, who have these chairs installed, is once that swivel chair goes into the vehicle, the airbag and the seat belt in that passenger seat are no longer operational to the standard that when the manufacturer first put that vehicle on the road. So I'm trying to understand if we're protecting the public, how that helps them. And then secondly, the other point I'd like to raise is touting is another point that's brought forward all the time. And only this weekend, it was evident in Beverly, there was a number of vehicles with plates from outside of the East Riding that were just touting. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the um, swivel seat issue, if I may. Um, the Life Authority has a duty to ensure that we have accessibility for all within the trade, in particular within Hackney carriages that are available for instant hire. The same provision should be available to somebody with an accessibility issue as it is to any other member of the public. So the authority has to consider how best to provide that here in the East Riding. And a decision was made some years ago that to have a mixed fleet of saloon vehicles and fully wheelchair accessible vehicles was the best offering for a rural area such as ourselves um, and the swivel seat means that the saloon vehicles can still offer assistance to people who maybe find it harder to get in and out of a saloon vehicle but maybe don't want to travel in a big wheelchair accessible vehicle for example and um, all swivel seats that are fitted have to be done through um, an approved manufacturer and they have to come with warranty so it is the when the seats are fitted they are fitted correctly However, obviously in line with the Department of Transport's most recent guidance, there will be a review of the provision in the East Riding and how we look to move that forward. Um, obviously the outcome of that is not known yet. That needs to be looked at in some detail as to what we provide. But accessibility is a key feature. Even moving forward, we must ensure that this service is available for everybody to use. 
So is it accessibility at the cost of safety? Uh, which of those is a higher priority for us? We're obviously operating in a very rural area and should a resident or a passenger in one of these vehicles be involved in a collision, like most people, we're expecting our seatbelt to hold us in and we're expecting an airbag to pop out and stop us going through the windscreen. If it... The um, requirement for either a swivel seat vehicle or a fully wheelchair has been the case from since about 2014 now. And in that period of time, unfortunately, there has been a number of vehicles that have been involved in road traffic collisions. And never in that time have we been aware that those airbags have either not deployed or there's been any impact to a passenger as a result of that swivel seat being in place. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Councillor Johnson, did you have a question? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. That's um really reassuring i have to say that every time i've used a taxi recently i've been absolutely delighted with the um with the driver who's been polite courteous i felt very safe in the taxi etc this is a technical question we've talked about hackney carriages private high vehicles and taxis what is the difference between them please okay so a taxi is a commonly used term for a hackney carriage vehicle so quite often people refer to the whole trade as taxis but as far as the legislation is concerned, a hackney carriage is a taxi and a taxi is what's available for immediate hire in the district. So those are the ones that you'll see that sit on taxi ranks or they can be hailed in the street if they're available for hire. Whilst a private hire vehicle must be pre-booked through an operator in advance of your journey. Thank you very much. That's helped clarify that, um, that question. So my, my next question is, so if I'm out, say, with my mother in the street and I needed a wheelchair accessible vehicle how would i find one because okay. they're not necessarily private high vehicles that are fitted out or capable of carrying a, a wheelchair um there's, there's two options available to you obviously the hackney carriages we've just discussed which are available for immediate hire and um, those obviously can be located in and around these riding on the taxi ranks and obviously they're even more visible now with having the livery on they're very clear to see from a distance which ones are east riding vehicles but we also um, have a list on our website in which we will list every accessible vehicle and the contact details where those operators are happy for those to be released so that people who have a particular need can find that vehicle and make sure they can book it. That's really helpful. Thank you. How do we actually advertise that? Probably, you know, for the man in the street, how, how would they, they know how to do that? Um, as I said, it's it's mentioned on obviously on the website and we have a, a link to that. But we do obviously when we go out for public campaigns in relation to sort of the festive period, etc., we will always mention that there is a, that list there. And if anybody wants it, it's updated on a very regular basis. Every time the vehicles are renewed or there's a change, that list is updated to keep it as accurate as possible. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I just wonder whether uh, we might have a think about a recommendation in terms of um, just from our pre-meeting there was a general lack of understanding of, of the different types of, of taxi available. And I just wonder whether we can make a recommendation to do more as, as a council to get the message across to the public as to what the differences are. I'm not sure how we'd do that, but it may be something we could look at. Well, again, we've got your East Riding, haven't we? Just a, an, an article in that is it's helpful. I, I, you know, people do look at them, do read them, etc. So, thank you. Yeah, sorry, Andrew, you want to... Just a just a couple of points really, and um, Louise and Tina will correct me if I get this wrong. But I think from a colour vehicle point of view, if it's Hackney, it's white. Is that correct? And then for private hire, there can be any colour other than white. But I'll I'll be stand corrected if I've got that wrong. But again, quite a distinctive way of knowing the difference between a Hackney um, and a, a private hire. And I'm just conscious, um, Councillor Hobby, that we missed um, Councillor Smith's other question around touting. So uh, we can come back on that if if you wish. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to ask your I've asked the question on touting. Yeah. Can we get the answer on the on the uh, the touting question, please? Thank you. Certainly. Um, just in relation to um, what Angela's just mentioned, that is correct. The base colour for all hackney carriages in this area is white, and then they have the livery applied, which you, you will have seen is um, the East Riding green bonnet with the East Riding rose, which appears on the sides and rear of the vehicles. 
um, and that's not allowed for private hire. So private hire vehicles can be any other colour other than white. The other difference we have here in these riding is the markings on the vehicle will very clearly tell you whether it's private hire or hackney carriage. They all must have door ovals on and those will be white door ovals saying hackney carriage all the way across or they'll be yellow saying private hire pre-book only. Um, in relation to the touting question, um, we do have offices that do work in the nighttime economy. They did do um, a series of work over the festive period and um, being out in that nighttime economy, having a look at the vehicles. The other thing that we have been doing is we've been working with our partners in Humberside Police over the last few months to do some stops on vehicles in areas and to have a look at those sort of concerns. The vehicles can be in the area if they have got a pre-booked job. So it is a case of trying to establish whether that vehicle is actually pre-booked. And if it is pre-booked, it, it can sit, as long as it's not sat on a taxi rank, it can lawfully sit there and wait to pick up its booking. So the main thing is just to, for us to be having a look and ensuring that those vehicles are legitimately pre-booked and they are waiting for a fare. Okay, Councillor White, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got a few. Shall I do them all at once? They're quite quick. Not no? too many. Okay. They'll be um, greedy. Sorry. <laughs> just wanted to echo uh, Councillor Johnson and the Chair's concern over about the, um, the information out there. Um, I knew nothing about the different types of taxis. I've not seen any of your campaigns. Um, so I think we need a, a maybe a bigger push on that. And then it was, there was just two concerns. It was the piece where you wrote that it was from the Midlands and from Northern cities, we were getting other uh, taxis coming in. I just wondered why. And also there was 11 years. Um, so if you had been refused, revoked or suspended, um, it was held on the database for 11 years. I just wondered why 11 years and if it being refused, should it not permanently be on there just as a record? Thank you. Yeah, just on the getting information out there to the public, uh, we can talk to the comms team about what we can do, perhaps with our social media page and stuff to get regular updates out there. Um, as Louise said, we did do uh, some comms stuff over Christmas about how to use taxis safely. I was dragged out to do quite a lot of radio interviews about that. So we did get out there over Christmas because that's the time where taxis seem to be most used generally throughout the year. Um, but I can talk to the comms team and between us we'll get something else up and running more regularly using our social media channels and stuff. Who wants to pick up uh, the other? I will, thank you. Um, in relation to the 11 years, um, that's actually prescribed in the legislation in relation to what every authority must put it on there and retain it for 11 years where there's been a, re a refusal, revocation or um, a suspension of a licence. Um, so obviously all the data that we upload stays on there for 11 years. However, that's not to say that internally where there's a serious safeguarding or public safety risk, that information can be kept longer. Um, but it just stays on the national database for 11 years. Um, in relation to the vehicles coming from the Midlands and um, the north of the country, it's just due to the volume of vehicles being granted in those areas in particular as to why those are the, the ones that we're seeing start to appear. There's large volumes of vehicles and licences being granted in some of those areas, which means people are now starting to spread across England and Wales with those vehicles. So is there, is there a feeling it's easier to, to get to become licensed in other areas? Uh, than it is ours or, or, or do we just not have the demand here that um, other areas have I suppose is the question that it begs isn't it certainly I mean we're not receiving any information to say we've got an unmet demand in this area um, and that is something obviously we do monitor on a regular basis particularly in relation to numbers of um, licensed drivers and operators and the provision we've got um, I, obviously although there's a national standard in place local authorities are free to have further standards on top of that to obviously enhance safeguarding. So there will still be some variance between local authorities in the levels that are required. I think one, whilst comparing ourselves to other authorities, one thing to point out too is that we've taken the decision to freeze our licensing fees this year to try and encourage more people to become license holders and taxi drivers, where a lot of local authorities are increasing theirs across the country and actually come Comparing to our neighbouring authorities, we are actually cheaper. So we are doing what we can to try and encourage people to licence here in these riding. But as Louise says, we need to make sure that we are doing that with public safety in mind. OK, thank you. Councillor Pickering. 
Yeah, um, thank you, Councillor White. Who probably <clears throat> asked the questions I was going to ask, but at least it's been answered. Um, this this issue about the cross border thing. I think you were saying that that the the licensing is standardised across the country, but the laws are basically interpreted slightly different in different areas. So, for example, number of MOTs that they have to go through. Is it is it two that we we ask our taxi people to go through? And it might only be one elsewhere. The other thing is, how, I don't suppose you know the numbers, but there are quite a few that I've seen and spoken to, Hull drivers who were living in Hull, who were going to Wolverhampton to get the licences, because it's perceived as being cheaper. Again, wouldn't mind a comment on that. I, th I think it was interesting to hear that we've frozen things, which again might might address some of those problems about whether it's cheaper or not. Thank you. Um, as mentioned, the, the national standards did come in, which gave a, a base level that every licensing authority should be at. And that base level is a safety level, effectively. Um, but it, there's nothing to stop licensing authorities going above and beyond that, where they think it is appropriate for their area or necessary. And um, so that's where the variance will come in. So although all authorities will have to meet that minimum, some will have further requirements on top of that. And obviously, there'll be a variance in fees as to what it costs that authority to administer, enforce and comply that regime in that area as well. Um, in this area, you particularly mentioned certificates of compliance. It depends on the age of the vehicle. For vehicles over six years of age, they are tested twice annually. For vehicles under six years of age, they're only tested once. So, so is it cheaper? to get these licenses yeah, elsewhere yeah. in the country is basically what I'm saying. Um, and is that what people are doing? There is there is some authorities across across England that do have lower fees than others, yes. Okay, Councillor Sarable. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for the presentation. My question is about the numbers. So in the beginning of your presentation, you said we have 289 licenses. Uh, hackney cars is that 200 i can't remember exactly the number but is this including the licenses that been uh, achieved outside east riding so like um, uh, midland or north do we have a number of those uh, cars that no i'm afraid we we don't know how many vehicles or drivers who maybe live in the east riding for example are licensed with another authority you, you don't obviously have to live in that area necessarily to work there. So, for example, we do have a number of licensed drivers who reside in Hull or York, but they do work within the East Riding. So where you've obviously got very close neighbouring authorities, you will get that crossover. But there isn't a number in relation to how many vehicles or drivers there is in this area that are licensed by other authorities. Um, but yes, we do currently actually have 291 licensed drivers that uh, or are licensed through this authority and working in this area. Sorry, Chair, can I just ask... Thank you for that. How would you make sure that they are safe and how how would you have a control over the other, um, you know, um, licenses that come into the area? You are only talking about the number very specific to East Riding. Um, whose responsibility is this? So, for example, if there is an issue in that taxi, you said that the CCTV cameras or fully uh, sound operation is within this 291. Then how, how are we going to make sure that we are safe? If you're using that personally, if somebody doesn't know where the license has been when they stop in the taxi, then how are we going to make sure that they are safe or how are we going to make sure that, you know, personally using very local one, to my idea, is better than um, using other taxis that they have got license from somewhere else, cheaper or easier to get. How would you make sure that is safe? Thank you. Um. Obviously, one of the challenges is that it's, it is completely lawful for those vehicles to work in these areas. Um, as long as, obviously, if they're pre-booked, their booking must go through their licence base and it must come then back out to the driver and vehicle. Um, the powers for the authority are limited when the licences are not granted by this area. So the officers don't have enforcement powers against those drivers or vehicles. Um, what we can do, obviously, is have our eyes and ears open and report those issues back to the issuing authority if we see anything of concern. I wonder if we can make a recommendation. I was going to say that. That uh, maybe we can push 
somehow through through these riding for um national standards in other words you know if 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 we find that cctv is so successful here are we getting that message across at a national level that it should be encouraged throughout the country so we so i think to councillor sarable's point you know if if the guy, the average person on the street may may not know whether it's a, a, a local one or a, one from Nottinghamshire or whatever. But if the standard was the same throughout the country, then uh, they, they would at least have some comfort that it, it, there should be a safe in uh, what, whatever taxi they get into. I think just to add to that, Councillor Holt, they, um, they're not national standards in relation to the CCTV. It's something that the East Riding decided to do to protect its residents. Um, and so it is very much up to the local authorities whether they wish to do it. And it's also based on risk and evidence, because when you put a system in, so when we did it voluntary initially, it was with an idea to try and get um, the drivers to work with us and get an idea of what the problems might be um, in terms of customers running off, not paying, assaults on drivers, allegations against drivers. And so we put it in for that reason. Um, and once it was successful, we mandated it for everybody. I do have to say on the back of what Louise was saying that we do have some drivers who choose to go to other authorities to get licensed for a number of reasons and the same reason they don't want CCTV put in. And they're the ones that we have to keep an eye on and the ones that we know might be in our area. But we are limited in terms of the enforcement powers we have. Um, the authority who issues the license should be enforcing Obviously, if it's issued by um, the West Midlands or down south, it's very difficult for them to enforce that on a day-by-day -day basis. And we have asked for information from the authorities in terms of how many um, people, that, drivers in the East Riding are working for themselves. And we can't get any information. They're not prepared to give that information. Um, so it makes it very difficult for us. Um, but we do the best we can. And where a driver who was licensed with us suddenly chooses to get licensed elsewhere or doesn't want CCTV in, does raise some concerns and we will keep an eye on those vehicles. And, you know, the best source of our evidence is from the trade, the licensed trade, tell us what's going on out there. And they take photographs, they feed information into us. So we've got a very good working relationship with them in trying to keep the East Riding safe. Councillor Aaron, yeah. yeah um, Councillor Sarable uh, stole my thunder. I was going to ask a couple of questions, if that's all right. I'll just elaborate on them. Um, you've got 291 licensed drivers. Have you got a number that you think would be a maximum you, that you were going to attain to? Because I know Bridlington is virtually impossible to get a taxi at night. And um, the second question was, I did manage to get one last Friday night. And I was sat in it, and I was talking about his CCTV. And he says, they're all right, but they're not that brilliant because they're not getting picked up when something happens. He said, something happened to me. I'm still waiting for the police to come and have a look at my um, what happened. But he said, if, if, the, if it goes longer than two weeks, it'll be you know, erased. So who is monitoring it, and are we sure that we're getting everything that we need to? Um, in relation to the first question on do we have a, a target or a maximum number, no, we don't. The The more the provision that's available, the better for the residents, the free more choice that they have and the more availability there is at that point. Um, so no, there is no maximum in mind. Um, obviously, we, we're looking at that in relation to future-proofing it and ensuring that where possible we can teach people that there's some very good careers to be had in that industry and it's encouraging people to, to see that and to come forward and, and join it. Um, in relation to your second question, um, I'm, I'm not aware of which particular case you're referring to, but the CCTV systems don't sort of alert us, for example, to the fact that the panic button may have been pressed. We are relying on the drivers to tell us that an incident has occurred, and at which point we can usually have downloaded that footage within sort of 24, 48 hours. The officers will go out to those vehicles and download it. The police can't get direct access to that footage. What they do is they put data protection requests into the authority. We will then provide that as long as obviously we think it's been used for the, the correct purposes. Um, then we will release that CCTV footage. 
Um, so I'm not sure on this that particular case you're referring to whether the delay is in the request in the information um, because the downloads can happen very quickly. Yeah, it's just what he, he just told me that he was waiting for somebody to come and download it and he's been waiting for probably a week and he said after two weeks it gets wiped. That's It's only what I heard from him. So I'd have right. to, I don't even know who he was. I'd, I'd have to find him again. But it's just a taxi I used on Friday night. Okay, I'm not aware of anybody waiting that length of time. Obviously, we do have generic inboxes so I can see everything that the officers are dealing with on a day-by-day -day basis. I am aware of a couple of assaults that have happened in the last seven days, but those footage have already been taken off those vehicles. Um, so I'm not aware of one that's got any delay, I'm afraid. So it sounds as if the process is that um, the driver would get it downloaded by East Riding and then East Riding would release it to the police. It sort of sounded a little bit from what you were saying, Councillor, and as if as if that driver was expecting the police to. Yeah, I think step he was waiting for the, the police other... to come. I think he was mis misunderstood yeah, what was yeah. supposed to happen. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'm ra rather comforted knowing that um, our licensed taxis actually have CCTV. So I was wondering, do we actually put anything on the vehicles to show that there is CCTV in there? Because if I saw two taxis, one with the sign on saying, yes, there was, and one that wasn't, I would pick the one with the CCTV. So is it on there? Is it big? Is it noticeable? Please. No problem. Yes, all the vehicles have got um, yellow notices about this sort of size on both um, passenger windows. So whether you choose to get in the back of the vehicle or the front, as you're getting into the vehicle, this sign is there to tell you that the vehicle has got CCTV and that will be recording throughout your journey. The actual CCTVs can actually be seen within the vehicle. Most of them are, atta are attached just underneath where your rear view, camera, uh, rear view mirror is, and therefore you'll be able to actually see the device with the lights on as well. Yeah, so that, that's great. Um, again, it comes back to communication, getting that message out there. That's what the public should be looking for if they're getting in one of our licensed taxis, the CCTVs there. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sarabal, sorry, I cut you off in your prime. It's okay. It, that, just the back of my question, the previous question I asked. So if let's go back to that, you know, there is a hole or there is maybe some misunderstanding or my understanding. If we cannot, as Tina said, uh, track the licenses outside the region, how Humberside police or how to be, I mean, to put it in a very clear way, who is in charge of these that, like Tina said, we're not able to change them. We're not able to look at those. We don't have enforcement on that. Then how are we going to do? Is this two system, two authority need to work closely together? Humberside police, for example, can get the number of these cars easily if they want to, or these licenses or how that how that's going to be. Maybe this is a recommendation to look at it or what? I don't know. I haven't understand it yet. Um, it's, it's difficult because the number of vehicles coming in and out of the East Riding will change constantly. So, they, for example, somebody could book a, a vehicle from down south um, coming in from an airport and they're travelling home back to the East Riding. That vehicle will come in for a short period of time and it will obviously then depart back to, to where its base is. So, but obviously then there is vehicles that stay in the area on a regular basis that from outside the East Riding. But there isn't a way of necessarily being able to gather exactly where they are and what they're doing because that information is not held here by this, this council and therefore we can't access it. And as Tina's mentioned, the powers are not there to enforce or um, deal with compliance against those drivers or vehicles. However, obviously what we can do is, um, as I mentioned earlier, is we have been doing some proactive work with Humberside Police. They are able to stop the vehicles that are not East Riding. And obviously if issues are picked up, then that can be reported back to that licensing authority. But ultimately the responsibility for compliance and enforcement of those vehicles is the licensing authority that issued them. Uh, yeah, sorry, Councillor Hammond. Yeah, I think I think really the message to the public is is if you want to travel safely by taxi in the East Riding, is use an East Riding licensed taxi, and that's definitely the message we were pushing over Christmas, and we'll continue to push with all our communications. Is the safest way to travel, as because as has been explained, we can't control or enforce non-East Riding license holders. So the safest way to travel in the East Riding is to use an East Riding licensed taxi. The Hackney carriages are quite easy to see because they've got the livery on the side, which is a great initiative the council introduced. But generally, when you look around at the taxis going around, you can see what license uh, in authority gave it its license by looking at the number plate, generally, or the rear of the vehicle. 
Okay, great. Well, so we've got one final, very short question from Councillor Smith. Thank you. Uh, may I just ask, what is the cost of a licence? Is that a driver, a vehicle, sorry? Yes. Yeah, so if I was to apply as a member of the public and, uh, and go for a hackney carriage stroke, a dual licence, what would that cost be for me to apply? Okay. Um, if you're applying for a vehicle, it's around £200 for a 12-month licence. If you're applying for a driver, those are issued for a three-year duration, and got there. They're about two hundred and eighty-nine off the top of my head. Um, but that's over three. That, that lasts for three years. That license. That's a very precise about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. I think it's been a really interesting presentation and discussion, and uh, it's opened up a few questions really, which. Um, I'm not sure I feel any, any sort of um, happier about it than I was before because it's, I think it's maybe one of the recommendations should be that possibly our portfolio holder might think about putting something together to take, to suggest at a higher level, at a, a national level, that we should have national standards so we wouldn't have to worry about people coming in and the, the I mean, it, I know it's it's a long shot, but I think it might be worth making making the point. So I, I don't know whether we're as, as, so I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I'm always happy to promote us as a flagship authority who does it right and make the rest of the country follow our example. Quite right. Well done. And then the second recommendation is that, um, as we discussed, um, we should, uh, and we, yeah, I think we agreed this, that we should uh, promote what the taxi services are what what is available and also the differences between the types of taxis and and what's involved and i think we can maybe do that through for whatever um resources we already have so on that basis are we happy with those two recommendations and anything else anybody wants to add okay well i'd just like to thank uh louise and tina for coming and uh, I, I was on license in 2003 which i used to enjoy and all sorts of different things to come up um, but so keep up the good work and uh, keep our people sa safe thank you very much so we're not we're not no one's allowed to leave the room apart from uh... <laughs> yeah of course you can yeah Yeah, it was good. Sorry to stop you. I, I thought you were going to turn all Richard Meredith on the ground. Yeah, you know, go off. <laughs> okay, right. So we're going to carry straight on with. Item number four, which is the social housing regulator brackets, including the housing ombudsman and Angela. Uh, sorry, uh, Gary, you're going to um, Councillor McMaster, rather. Sorry, right. you're going to lead on this. Thank you. Yep. Good morning, Chair, Councillors and Officers. Um, the regulator of social housing is stepping up the controls of all providers of social housing. So from April of this year, the reg regulator will start random inspections. Um, on providers of social housing, both physically and through analyzing complaints procedures, as well as tenancy satisfaction reports. This means we will need to carry out annual tenancy satisfaction reports and react promptly to the results. The first of these um, satisfaction reports surveys has already been completed, and Angela will elaborate shortly on the, on the outcome of those results. Whilst the need to carry out these controls is completely understood, um, we, need to, we need to also understand that the pressure on both, both financially and physically on this authority will be felt. It's, it's quite a demand on us. Additionally, whilst we will obviously work diligently to prevent the rise in the number of complaints, it would be unreasonable to not accept an increase. Additionally, as historically, this authority has always had very few complaints, a small increase in numbers would result in a huge increase in percentages. So, for example, and I'll stand corrected, I think last year we only had, I think it was three cases of mull management against us from 11,500 houses, which is really very, very good. 
So with all the increased inspections, if we get an extra two or three, that amounts to a 100% rise. So we just need to be careful that we don't, in our circumstances, think that a 100% rise in the number of complaints is a big number. It's a big percentage rather than a big number. Uh, and I'll just hand over to Angela, who will elaborate more on the finer details. Thank you, Councillor McMaster. And I'm just going to sort out my screen, if you just bear with me. Um, just, be, just before you start, Angela, yes. while you're doing that, I, I'd just like to introduce uh, Paul Cooper, who's come along as a rep representative of, of the tenants. And um, it's your first meeting with us, Paul. And uh, I won't put you on the spot, but if there's anything you want to add or make comment on, please make, just give us a, a wave. Thank you. Apologies. Apologies, Chair. I should have said welcome, and I didn't. I didn't know you pre before. Welcome. Sorry, bear with. I'm just going to get into uh, the right format if I can. Uh, if I can find it. Yeah, I've done it yet. Okay, I've got my. You are. Okay, I'm on. Excellent. So, um. Following Councillor McMaster's introduction, um, myself and, and Matt Turner will, will cover this presentation. Um, it, the presentation will just highlight the issues that are covered in, in the report that you've all received, and I know you'll, you'll have already had a read of, but um, we already are regulated by um, the regulator of social housing, but the significant change we see, as Councillor McMaster said, is the introduction um, of the on-site inspection by all housing uh, providers um, and that'll be on a four-year cycle starting from the 1st of April 2024 and what we don't know is when we might um, receive an inspection so what's really important for us is to make sure that we're inspection ready and the focus of that inspection will be around the four consumer standards so it's a consumer standards inspection that the regulator will be will be looking at um, so I'll cover that in a little bit more detail but just to say that um, Matt, Matt will go through more detail about the housing ombudsman's role and some changes that um, are coming through in terms of um, the way they'll operate. But it's very much around the regulator of social housing and the housing ombudsman working collectively to look at how we improve standards in social housing. Um, and just the area that Matt will cover in more detail is the role of the housing ombudsman in investigating complaints and ensuring that disputes are resolved, but also to look at lessons learned and to make sure that changes um, are being implemented. So I mentioned the four consumer standards. So this is what the regulator will ask us to demonstrate compliance with when they come in and do an inspection. Um, so they'll look at how safe our homes are for our council tenants and whether we're meeting all of the requirements there to make sure that they're um, safe from a health and safety perspective, but also that we're meeting the decent home standard. The transparency, influence and accountability standard is very much about how we provide information, how we enable um, our tenants to influence and shape service and help us look for improvements. Um, and it's it's great that we've got Paul here today um, as part of this, this committee. And then they'll look at neighbourhood and community standards, so look more broadly um, about how we make sure that we support our tenants um, in their homes, look more broadly, how we deal with um, antisocial behaviour, how we look after the immediate environment in, around our properties. And finally, the tenancy standard is about how we allocate our properties, the types of tenancies that we give um, and how we support our tenants in that way. So those are the areas um, that the inspect inspector will particularly um, focus on. I think it's also important to say that um, we don't know the full details yet of what the inspection um, format will be, but we know that they will be on the inspector will come on site. They're likely to be on site for a couple of days. It's highly likely that they'll ask to sit in this committee if they can work the timing out. So they'll want to attend um, a committee like this. It's very likely that they'll want to meet with our tenants. They might want to go out on a site walk. So they'll look at data that they already hold and understand about the East Drive and the Yorkshire Council, and they'll tailor their inspection um, accordingly. And we'll get six weeks notice um, of that inspection, and they'll tell us the scope, and they'll tell us the type of documents that they, that they want to 
receive. So as I said at the beginning, it's really important that we're preparing um, and making sure that we're ready for that. And we've been doing a lot of work over the last two years to make sure that we are as ready as we can be, because as I said, we don't know where we will be in that four year cycle. Um, Councillor McMaster mentioned um, one of the other changes um, that's um, recently been introduced. This was re re uh, introduced as a result of the Social Housing Regulation Act. Um, and this introduces a set of tenant satisfaction measures that all registered providers are required to report on on an annual basis. So the first year we've been collecting that data is for the current year that we're in, 23-24, and we need to submit that information to the regulator by June this year. I think we've talked previously at this committee about the landlord based measures. So those things that we can measure ourselves. So how quickly we report, uh, deal with a report of a repair, gas compliance, electrical compliance, but the other aspect of the tenant satisfaction measures are the tenant perception measures. So what do our tenants think about the services we provide, how satisfied, are they in, in the services we provide? And I'll cover that in a little bit more detail um, with the first set of results that we've received um, from that the tenant perception survey that we carried out in October last year. Um, so it's the first time we've, we've surveyed our tenants many on many occasions, but this is the first time we've used the prescribed um, set of questions that were required um, to by the regulator. Um, we needed to survey um, a set number of tenants to make sure that um, our results were statistically reliable. Um, as it says on the slide, we, we surveyed 977 tenants, um, so we, we know that we can rely on the results um, that, we've, that we've received. Um, so I'll touch on those results um, after Matt's given an overview of the, the Housing Ombudsman and we'll go through what those results are telling us and what some of the actions um, are that we'll be taking. And just the final point, which again, I think we've mentioned at this um, committee previously, uh, another significant change through the Social Housing Regulation Act is the requirement for uh, senior managers within housing services to hold professional qualifications in respect of um, housing. Um, and that's going to be tested through a competence and conduct standards. So we've got a number of colleagues who have started that process to get formal um, housing qualifications, and we know that we've got more colleagues that will need to do that. That requirement comes into force from April 2025, and there's a two-year leading period, so we have got time to make sure that all of our staff um, have got the appropriate training. So I'll hand over to Matt now to um, just cover um, a little bit about the role of the Housing Ombudsman. Good morning, everyone. So um, in terms of the housing ombudsman, they're there to investigate complaints and resolve disputes involving tenants and leaseholders. So they do a similar job to the local government and social care ombudsman that we work closely with as well. That's covering many of the other council services um, we operate. The good news in respect of housing is that the regulator for social housing has a memorandum now in place with the housing ombudsman, which means the two are working hand in hand very closely. It means when an investigation is taking place, they can be referring things between the two organisations, which should make everybody's life a lot easier, including the tenants and the people complaining. The key bit, as Angela touched upon, is the housing ombudsman's code. So for us, when it comes to dealing with complaints, the code, which becomes statutory on the 1st of April 2024, gives us a single robust set of standards for handling complaints. So this is what we design our complaint and feedback policy around making sure we comply with the code. One of the ways the Ombudsman makes sure we do that is by requiring us to do an annual self-assessment. So that annual self-assessment is published and is currently, because we've been doing it for the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman, reported to Overview Management and Scrutiny Committee on an annual basis with the other Ombudsman findings that go to that committee. The good news is, that the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman have aligned their code with the Housing Ombudsman code. So we've effectively got one set of standards, two aligned codes that cover the same things for all of the services that the council's providing when it comes to handling complaints. So what we've been doing as an organisation is making sure that our policy, which I mentioned earlier, complies with that code and any of the changes. So the good news is that we're in a strong position. We already make sure we comply with the local government social care ombudsman and a lot of the changes as we've said kind of mirror each other 
So what we've done in this report is just pull out some of the key items and some of them are on the slide there that we're looking at changing and that we're considering as part of the feedback policy review. That policy review is done with consultation from um, equalities groups, from housing tenants, from services across the council. So there's a lot of people involved in that process. And there has been since it was created in 1996 and through all of the iterations and revisions that have taken place for that policy. So rather than go through all the points, I'll just pull out a couple of key ones that I think it's worth drawing your attention to. Probably the most significant change within the policy that we'll be looking to make is removing any extra stages. So currently we have a stage called Team Solutions in there, which is something we try and do to triage and resolve things quickly for people before we go into stage one. So we'll be looking at removing that from the policy because it's very clear in the code about not having extra named stages. The other one is clarification around financial remedy. So obviously as part of the ombudsman processes, remedies are a big part of that. Some of those can include um, financial compensation and we'll be looking at enhancing and sort of improving the, clarif um, the information that's available through the policy and to officers as part of that process. Complex complaints will be handled within an additional 10 days. And what that's really saying is if somebody moves to stage two of the process, we'll be potentially looking at giving the people that deal with those stage two complaints more time to look at those complaints and consider them. And the third and the fourth one, sorry, that will probably be of interest is the code requires us to have a member responsible for complaints. So that's a lead elected member responsible for complaints and culture and promoting positive complaint handling across the organization. So we're currently in discussions with the portfolio holder for the corporate policy about that and how we progress that. But that's obviously something that will be, I'm sure, of interest to the committee. There are lots of other changes. But as I say, we've, we've been working with lots of services and organisations and groups to make sure that we comply. And the key message is that we are in a very good position. So there's only one thing that has to be removed for the 1st of April. The other things are more about aligning ourselves with the code. They're not fundamental changes that stop us complying with the code when it comes into place on the 1st of April. And hand back to Angela now. Thanks, Matt. So I just wanted to highlight um, briefly, um, and we've, we've touched on it earlier and is included in the report, but we know nationally um, that the Housing Ombudsman is really promoting the service. People will have probably heard adverts on local radio, encouraging tenants to know how they can make a complaint if they've got a concern um, about the, the social rented property. So nationally, there's been um, a, a significant increase in cases that are going forward to the Housing Ombudsman, a 27% increase and over 300% um, increase nationally of those cases where maladministration um, is, is identified. So there's certainly a change in context that we're working in, and Councillor McMaster um, alluded to that. There's a real push, I think, from the Housing Ombudsman, understandably, understandably to make sure that we, as an organisation, have got to make sure we're tailoring the services that we provide to meet individual needs, individual tenants' needs, and we recognise that, and I think it's an area that we've been striving to improve. Something else that we will be doing, and again, I'll touch on it when I go through the uh, tenant satisfaction measures uh, shortly, is to look at how we benchmark with other um, authorities so we understand our performance um, when, we, when we compare ourselves with other authorities. And I know the report that uh, Matt takes on an annual basis to overview management scrutiny committee always does set out how, we, how we're performing in comparison with others. So that's something that we will, uh, we will continue to do. I think it's really important that we look at our communication so that we're as clear as we can be um, in terms of information to tenants and leaseholders, not just about how they make complaints if they've got them, but how they can access services more broadly. And again, working with Paul and his colleagues on the tenant panels, that's something that we really look to tenants' advice and guidance about how we can do that and how we can improve that. And again, uh, Matt touched on it in terms of what we're required to do with the changes to the code, but making sure our information um, that's publicly um, available on the website is also clear and up to date, including the performance information and the information that we're, that we're required um, to provide. And we know that when the regulator um, decides to come and inspect um, a housing provider, one of the first things they're likely to do as a desktop exercise is look at the, the website and look at the information that's available. 
So finally, I just wanted to touch um, on the first set of um, tenant perception measures um, the survey that we carried out last, last October, just to run quickly through the results. These were included um, as an appendix in um, with the report. So I hope people can hopefully read them easily, either in the report or, or on one of the screens. But just to clarify what we've done, these 12 measures are preset. So the questions as they're phrased and how we collect that information is very um, prescribed by the regulator of social housing. So we haven't adjusted the questions at all. So sort of important to note that. So our scores are in the left-hand column. Um, the middle column is how we compare with all providers nationally that have submitted their data. So that could be um, housing associations, it could be local authorities, um, but it's it's that national that's not that national picture. If we wish to, we can drill down if we want to compare with organisations that are more like ourselves. So if you wanted to pick a rural um, local authority, for example, or other rural local authorities. Um, but this is just initially a view as of how we position ourselves um, compared to all national providers. So I think overall, um, for a fair set of um, tenant perception measures. There is some reason for optimism, but some clear areas where we need to where we need to do more work. Um, overall, in terms of overall satisfaction with the service, the landlord service from East Riding of Yorkshire Council, how we um, work with our tenants, um, we are um, above the the national median, at near, just short of seventy seven percent. There's some work I think we need to do in terms of repairs because we're under the national median when we look at overall satisfaction with repair service just under the national position um, with our results at 73.7%. Um, again, we're a, a way below the, the national median in terms of tenants um, who report that they're satisfied with the time taken to complete the most recent repair. So again, that's something that we, we want to take a close look at. However, on the other side, um, we're ahead of um, other providers in terms of our respondents reporting that they're satisfied with the way that we maintain um, their home. So I think, again, that's a positive. Something that I think, um, and I met with Paul and, and the other tenants um, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about what are the most important things um, to our tenants. And I think, and Paul will correct me if, I, if I've remembered this incorrectly, but Safety and security came through really strongly as something that tenants feel, you know, is is, you know, one of their top priorities, and it's some really encouraging that eighty six percent um of our tenants feel that we provide um a home that's safe, but there's more that we can do there. We want to increase that. We are above the median, but we want to make sure that more of our tenants um feel like that. Again, next area, it's it's quite a low percentage, just short of sixty five percent, who uh, of respondents um, who feel that we're listening to the views and acting upon them. So again, something I think we need to take into account and work with our tenants about how we can improve that. And I know one of the things that we we need to improve on is a bit of the you said we did. So when tenants tell us something, that we're giving that feedback um, and saying what we've done um, about that feedback. Just to go through the final um, set of indicators quickly, um, do our tenants um, feel that they're kept informed about things that matter to them? Again, slightly above the median, but more work that we can probably do there. The next indicator is really important because the regulator in the recent um, webinar that I was on with the regulator of social housing, an area that they're going to be really interested in is whether we treat our tenants um, fairly and with respect. So that's a really big issue and quite rightly so. Um, so again, we can always improve, but I, I think it's a good starting point um, to see that 86% of tenants agree with that and we are above the median there. So again, more to do. Linking in to our earlier, um, the slides that, that Matt went through and, and our review of um, the, the complaints approach, um, this is clearly an area for concern in that of tenants who um, report um, a complaint and then report that they're satisfied um, in terms of the complaints handling, um, that is only at 30%. 
obviously you can see from the median in that middle, middle column, it's something that all providers are struggling with. So it's an area that we want to do more, <clears throat> do more work on. And we, it was a consultant that supported us to do this first survey. We're asking um, that consultant to do some focus work in conjunction with our staff um, and with our tenants to understand some more about people that have made a complaint, what aspect of the complaint handling were they particularly dissatisfied with so we can look at how we um, make some significant improvements there and we'll also look at how we can learn from best practice elsewhere. Another area for, um, for um, focus for was something that we were already aware of and we've put additional funding into the budget for 2024-25 and beyond is our communal areas making sure that they're clean and well maintained. We know that we need to restart a really comprehensive programme um, of uh, redecoration of those communal areas. We've got the budget in place, so we want to talk to tenants on a local basis about what that would look like in their particular area. Um, and then final two indicators um, are areas that we can, again, take a close look at in, about um, whether we're making a positive contribution to the overall neighbourhood that we've got um, our tenants' homes uh, situated in, and then finally, how we deal with antisocial behaviour. So again, um, those aren't particularly high um, percentages, although the, they are above the median areas that I think we'll want to look at and talk to tenants about how we can, um, how we can improve. Um, so I think that was my last slide. So that concludes the presentation, Chair, so I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Angela, for a very comprehensive, uh, and, that, and that for a very comprehensive report. Um, <clears throat> uh, and it's encouraging to see uh, see the, the, the direction of travel. Can I just quickly ask uh, Angela, the, this tenant satisfaction survey, you probably said it earlier, is it annual, done annually or done less? Yeah, it's it's um, an annual survey that we'll, we'll carry out. So we'll be planning ours for October this year, the next one. I, so I, I, I think before we even start, I, I think I would suggest we maybe as a recommendation that we get an update on this on an annual basis. It doesn't have to be a full paper, but just a, a, so that we can monitor how 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 we are improving or not on those on those twelve points. Absolutely, Chair. And I think again, when we talk about the regulator, that's the level of scrutiny that the regulator would expect to see. This committee is asking for. So absolutely, we can do that. Okay, so Councillor Needham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation there. Um, <coughs> question twofold. The first one is with regard to the number of respondents. So we say 977, which sounds a good statistic, and we've got some percentages there, but it doesn't indicate how many people are actually reaching. So what sort of percentage of tenants do we reach? Um, and how can we increase that? How can we gain more people to complete it? Um, and how do we promote that? Secondly, I was concerned about the large increase in referrals to the Ombudsman. And I'm just wondering what the reasoning behind that is for tenants. Is it because we have a poor response in dealing with that in East Riding? Or is it that there's some financial recompense by going to the Ombudsman? Is there any benefit for residents to complain that way rather than through ourselves? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'll take take the first question uh, first. So 977 is approximately 10% of our tenant population, which, as I said, is uh, deemed to be statistically reliable. We can, if we want, um, increase that percentage and, and survey more um, more of our tenants. But the other thing we can also do is ask um, in the next survey that we can split it in certain ways. So if we wanted to look at particular demographic or, you know, if maybe older tenants are less or more satisfied. So we can, you know, be a bit more specific in um, in how we how we choose to to look at that. But yeah, that temp about 10 percent. Um, is the, is the 977 to take the second question um i think there's a number of a number of aspects of this i think there's more there's been a lot of publicity um around social housing standards quite a lot in the media um issues related to damp and mold and and the sad death of awabi shack um, so i think there's a lot more um awareness um for people sort of to raise issues um Clearly, we want to make sure that people are raising issues with us in the first instance and that we should be able to resolve that. And we've done a lot of work. Uh, Jeff and his team have undertaken um, complaint 
um, training so that we make sure we're really getting to the heart of the issues that tenants um, are raising with us so that we do endeavour to resolve it. Unfortunately, we don't always get things right. I think we always sort of refer to the fact we do about 40,000 repairs um, on an annual basis. So unfortunately, sometimes things do go wrong and sometimes we don't, even through the complaint process, we don't quite get it right. We are trying to we, we are trying to improve that. So some people do choose to go to the ombudsman. And I think in recent cases where we've had um, maladministration findings, there's some really useful learning for us. And I think it helps us to see how closely the ombudsman scrutinizes whether we're complying with our own policies how we're supporting ten tenants on an individual basis and understanding their particular vulnerabilities so i think the increases raised awareness um i think we have got further improvements we need to make um if i'm being absolutely honest we you know we've started that process we're looking at the learning from the complaint so that we can continue that journey and certainly as i said that 34% of satisfaction where people have made a complaint we will do that those focus groups with the tenants to understand more about why they were dissatisfied with our process right, sorry Ga gary we're we just going to make a yeah thank you if i may um 10% is the target figure that that the statistics say we have to achieve this is done this is handled by an external company because obviously if we did the survey ourselves we could be accused of manipulating the figures marking our own homework etc so if we were to go back and say we would like a bigger chunk of the, the market, it would just cost us more money. And obviously that money would have to come from maintenance, for example, or something else. So I'm quite I'm quite happy it is suffice. It's our first time. We'll learn a bit from that as we go along. And additionally, when it came to the increase in, in um, complaints, I said right at the beginning, I think we did remarkably well. I, and I stand corrected. I think it was three referrals that we had maladministration against us last year and much the same the year before. Um, there's been a lot of adverts on TV about mold and things like that, you know, ambulance chases, encouraging people to come forward. You are going to get the odd person who comes forward as a result of that. And as I said before, two or three additional complaints amounts to 100% in our case. So in a sense, we're kind of victims of our own success, whereas other authorities who perhaps had 10 or 15 referrals a year or maladministration cases against them a year, if they get a two or three number increase as a percentage, it's only 20%. So we just got to be careful that we look at the numbers and not the percentages. But I'm I'm happy with the ten percent. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Jeff. I just uh, add to what uh, Councillor McMaster said and uh, Angela said about the housing ombudsman. Um, they have um, amended their guidance so that um, tenants can now complain to the housing ombudsman at any stage of the complaint process. So they do not have to go through our complaints process to um, satisfy. The housing ombudsman so they can go direct from day one and that's what the you know that's the um advice that they're getting from the housing ombudsman and that's what tenants are doing now not just locally but nationally so the number of referrals to the housing ombudsman's increased substantially over the last two or three years and we expect it to increase going forward due to the publicity etc yeah. Just um, with regard to the question, there's no financial recompense then by going down that route. I was just wondering whether there's a financial incentive or it just speeds things up. That was just the end of it. Yeah, so the uh, the housing ombudsman can make a financial remedy order as part of their determination. Um, they can also ask us to um, change policy and, and, and a number of other things. Um, I mean, we do have the ability when we're going through our own complaints procedure if we think we've we've not done something well and we feel that we should make a financial remedy that's something that's within our policy and and i suppose going back to the early point we do sometimes get things wrong and if we if there is you know we should make a, a compensation payment during our stage one or stage two um, stage, then we should we should certainly do that. But yes, the the ombudsman and I don't know if people have seen in the media, but again, there've been some quite high uh, financial remedy penalties that the housing ombudsman has applied to certainly some London authorities um, and some London housing associations, sort of four figure um, orders, you know, five thousand pound for for some of the serious maladministration cases. Jeff, did you want to come back on that? I was just going to add that what Angela's just said about the housing ombudsman um, increasing their sort of financial penalties to local authorities has increased. Uh, that's significant over the last couple of years. Um, and I think that's a sort of um, a thought process for, for all local authorities and social landlords about 
you know, how the housing ombudsman's perceiving uh, social landlords. Um, and, you know, that's a recognition for this committee as well. Thank you very much. Um, Paul, did you want to? Right. First of all, thank you for um, the warm welcome that I've received today. Um, I've got um, two questions. One of them has partly been answered, but I will cover it again. The first one is regarding this uh, TSM perception survey. Um, I will be, my maybe members, uh, look forward to seeing the next one. However, a question I would ask is, um, from the regulator's point of view, um, would they be asking about what the age range would be regarding this? And I know you said that um, this is an external company that have, have given these questions. Um, but I, I, I looked at this in detail last night and again today, and I think somebody under the age of 40 would probably answer some of these questions differently to somebody of an age over, over 50. Um, I also... Um, the section at the bottom where TP12 regarding the proportion of residents who report that they are satisfied with East Ryde and Yorkshire Council's approach to handling of antisocial behaviour. I'm well aware that the council have a climate resilience team and neighbourhood watch. Um, however, again, I think that's a grey area because many tenants and committees have been on. It's some will blame, they, they think the police should take responsibility and they think the council should take responsibility. So that question there, again, I think probably needs to be um, put in a different way. That would be my advice to the outside agency who's, who's written that. Um, and the other question is which um, um, I think Councillor Needham referred to, and Andrew tried to, um, well, answered, regarding the number of referrals, um, do you think it is um, the damp and mould policy, which has been in the news? We are aware as tenants, and it's also in the media, there's these companies going around putting leaflets through, wanting to um, get compensation off the, the local authority. This is um, possibly giving a false negative to those readings. We, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Paul, for those questions. So I think um, the question set, as you as you suggested, it is set by the regulator of social housing. So we don't have the ability um, to to sort of tweak the questions at all. We can ask additional questions, but we can't change the actual wording of the questions. But I think the point um, that's been made, and, and you've just made, Paul, is that it is the first year of the questions and the regulator of social housing has made it really clear that they see the first year as been a year of making sure from a data quality point of view that all local authorities are submitting their data in the right way um, to if there are any questions that might be ambiguous or could be worded in a better way I think the you know they'll listen to listen to that feedback so they've been quite open in saying they expect it's going to be probably two to three years of data before they'll have something that they can really compare nationally and see, you know, what the key the key themes are that are that are emerging. So so we can't actually sort of change the, the question set as it stands. I think in respect of the the age issue or any other demographic issue or any issue relating maybe to geography, when we set um the the question set and, and we used the we used an external consultant from an efficiency point of view and as councillor mcmaster said so that we've got that level of independence and it was a really good process actually that we went through and um, we could we could ask um to look specifically at our younger tenants responding differently have they got a different perception to maybe some older tenants so that absolutely is something that we could look at if we felt it was important to understand that and how that might help us tailor services or again whether we could look at it geographically to see whether you know do tenants feel different about services in Bridlington than they may be doing goals so we've got that opportunity to sort of tailor that as long as we are able to submit the data that the regulators expect in which we which we would be able um to do i think the the point around um antisocial behavior i think it's another one that we we need to understand um 
in, in more detail really around what aspects um, of handling of antisocial behaviour um, are, are tenants dissatisfied? Um, is it around the information that we make available? Is it, as you suggested, being clear about the role of the police and the role of um, um, the local authority in dealing with antisocial behaviour? So I think again, it's one that we will we will need to take a closer a closer look at. And um, we are. Um, reviewing our antisocial behaviour um, antisocial behaviour policy and strategy, which will be coming to this committee um in, in a couple of months' time. So again it might be something that we want might want to ensure is appropriately reflected. And I think the final area that you touched on that uh, Councillor Needham had also um highlighted was this issue of number of referrals and I think as we said earlier, I think there's a number of factors in play, but I think there's absolutely no doubt that um, some of the publicity in the media around some of the damp and mould issues certainly highlighted that. And, you know, we're not in all of our properties all of the time, so I think it's important that people do know how to refer concerns if they've got them, and then we've got the opportunity to put things right. So, you know, that's the way we would want to deal with it. Um, but I think um, the other thing that was mentioned, um, I think you said about people putting, you know, letters through doors, sort of separate separately we know that tenants can make legal disrepair claims and there are some uh, solicitors companies that will um, provide information to tenants and, and advise them that they may wish to do that and again um, that's a very prescribed process and there can be um, financial um, issues related to that as well so the legal disrepair process is another issue that Jeff's team deal with um, so that we can resolve um, hopefully resolve those issues but um, certainly there's been letter dropping in certain communities in respect of that so I hope I've covered all of the questions you raised thank you did you want to add something Jeff I uh, just to add to what Andrew said um, is that um, you know we do learn lessons from complaints uh, we do have lessons learned sessions uh, and uh, we, ha we have learned some lessons from ASB cases as well that have gone to the housing ombudsman uh, so we have done training for staff as well in the area management teams, just to add to that. So we are actively um, addressing concerns raised by residents uh, through training, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you. So we're in, in the interest of time, can we make our questions fairly sharp and the responses equally sharp? Can we go to Councillor Smith? Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd just like to understand, if possible, what the if, if you broke the complaints down into particular niches, if there was a particular topic that came up time and time again. And secondly, kind of building on Mr Cooper's comments, I assume within social housing we have many elderly, or sorry, I say older people, um, and who could be digitally challenged. So how do they go about reaching out to the local authority to raise their complaints, please? Uh, so I will be brief in my response. Um, the main area that we get complaints about is repair and maintenance issues, I would say probably. Um, we do get complaints um, about people who want to move home and might be dissatisfied with their current accommodation. Uh, so there are certainly themes that, that would that would come through. So without taking too much time, I think they're, they're the main areas. Um, Matt, I don't know if you might want to pick up the, um, the second, which was about... Um, how different ways people can make complaints and um, there are different methods people can use. Um, yep, the complaint process is hopefully very straightforward. In essence, you can tell any member of staff, you can walk into any customer service centre, you can call our numbers and people will know how to push things through into the complaint process. There's an online form that's available 24-7. There are posters up which signpost people to forms that they can get if they want to do it in paper. But it really is as simple as just tell somebody online, paper, web, email, any of those options is fine and it will find its way into the complaint and feedback system and be logged officially. Thank you, Matt, for that. Uh, Councillor Pickering. Thank you, Chair. number of things. Um, just a definition to begin with, like social housing. I've always been concerned when they're going on about social housing. I don't know if it's an age thing. I always look to things like council houses, which which obviously we're lacking a great deal of. And in effect, we could do with a damn sight more. But that's another issue. By social housing, we, are we talking about our housing stock or are we including um, housing associations like North British Housing? Just, just as, a, as a starting point. So social housing covers 
registered providers that would um, rent their properties at what's classed as a, a social rent um, or even an affordable rent. And that's probably a much longer conversation about affordable rent in oh, terms yeah. of 80% of market rent. But it would, so social landlord could be ourselves as a local authority, or it, as you suggested, it could be a housing association that could be grouped um, as part of a social a social housing provider. Yeah, because yeah, obviously how you deal with that is, is quite different, isn't it? You know, we've got plenty of our residents, some are living in, in, in council accommodation, and, and the majority I speak to are very happy about that. And they're very happy about the work that your officers do. They're very happy about the complaints procedure. They're very happy about how things in general go. However, we've then got private, I'll call it private, we've got private providers who are obviously in there for the money. Let's, let's not be naive. They're going to make money out of this. But when it comes to dealing with problems, we're seeing, certainly in Hessel, a major problem in, in getting movement on that. So, so I would ask that, that you can give us a bit of an indication how you're going to improve on that. Obviously, alongside all the other stuff you've got to improve on, it's going to be a hell of a couple of years for you, isn't it? Huh? Um, when we talked about residents and how they com can complain, I don't think it's crystal clear at all, to be quite honest. I, I don't think that's the case at all. And, I, and I'd, I'd ask that we actually get some letters sent out, which is very plain, in plain speak, not not some of the gobbledygook that we've got, which makes them aware of, of how they can go along the process. That's not knocking your customer service, because I think they're brilliant. Heads of library staff are absolutely brilliant with this. And in that first stage, they're brilliant. It then goes off to our housing officers. And again, they've been very good with it. Unfortunately, at times it gets lost in the ether there. And, and the time scale of... of can you... Back ha, have, have you got a question? OK, you the answer. question is, how can we improve... How can we improve the fact that, and it's all right, Gary, saying that we've got three complaints or something. We've only got three complaints because people probably don't know how to complain. <laughs> so how can we make it more, more easy for people to complain about the problems that they've got? There's my question. Gary, you, would you like to answer um, that? What I'll do is, as Councillor Hammond said, you'd get in the next um, East Riding magazine, I'd get in the magazine, I'll put something in the magazine Absolutely. that goes to every household. So we could make a recommendation that the system becomes more crystal clear. Brilliant. Last, last, last question, very briefly. We've put it out to external company to do this this uh, consultation. One in ten, again, I think that's a bit rubbish, personally. Um, we've put it out to external company. Who is it and how much do we pay them? Um, the company are called Service and Insights, and we went through um, a tendering process to identify them. Um, we were given, a, because this is a new um, requirement on local authorities, we were given um, a small amount of funding um, this year, which we used to fund that process. Um, and it was to enable that independence and to get an efficient mm -hmm. service. And I would just add that the... Um, Service Insights are a social enterprise company, um, oh. so we got some significant added value, I think, through going through them. So they use call handlers who've got um, disabilities and additional needs to, to do the call handling. So we felt it was a really sort of positive approach, and we were very pleased with the way they, they handled it. I mean, that's it. brilliant, but how much did we pay them? Yeah, Chair, can I, can I come in on that? It, the, the value will be commercially sensitive because other providers then would know that that price sure. but what we can tell uh committee is the budget i don't know if we've got the budget to hand um but there'll be a budget figure not the price we paid uh, for those commercially sensitive reasons so we're not allowed to know what we've paid them um the, the councillors we can we can share that with you separately but not in a public forum okay that's fine if you could do that i'd appreciate it but obviously those sort of figures are very sensitive and you know when, when we're putting out we don't want everyone to know what we're already paying Chair, it's it's about is commercially sensitive for other providers in a com in a competitive process, um, but councils of course can know what the figure is, but not to be shared in the public domain, which is what this is, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I don't want to spend too much longer on this, but Councillor Jones. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Councillor Duke. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to go back to uh, Paul's uh, input, on, and, and I'm looking at the figures for uh, the ASBO, can we have a, a comprehensive report when you do your report on what I call di disruption moves? People are 
unhappy with their neighbours, how you deal with it, how quick you turn it around. Uh, some sort of ideas of nipping it in the bud prior to that so, so we can get some feedback, if that if that's possible, for the next report. Yes. Okay, Angie, do you want to... Yeah, Chair, I think um, antisocial behaviour is on the agenda. I'm looking at Liz, because is it June or July? June. So we can make sure we pick up those issues in that report. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Johnson, sorry. Yeah, well done. Thank you for um, standing. <laughs> You've been itching to speak, haven't you? Mine was just really a recommendation on the back of, of what various people have said with regard to um, the the um, percentage of people surveyed, both, um, and Angela mentioned, geographical, age, disability, etc. If, if we could look at some way of increasing that the number of subsets so we have a little bit more information going forward next time. Thank you. Okay, yeah, we can include that in a recommendation. Councillor White. Thank you, Chair. You'll be pleased to know mine was covered by Matthew. It was just about the complaints process. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Sarabal. Thank you, Chair. So my question is very brief, but to uh, reduce all of this complaint and bur burden and etc., is the council, is Riding Council, is making any uh, new development site for new houses, or is it beneficial to just work with private sector, or um, you know, just hire and you know, I want to get a bit of insight in that one. Yeah, thank. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we have in my next report. I'm. Uh, elaborating a bit more, but we have a number of old um, multi-story dwellings that we believe are beyond economical repair in terms of reaching a, a standard. And so we're going to demolish those and rebuild those into a new modern standard. So we we doing away with the older buildings and replacing them with newer buildings um, as fast as we possibly can. Okay, thanks very much. And as, as uh, Liz has pointed out, we have we've got a paper on housing maintenance coming up in in September, so we'll be able to pick up on that sort of thing. But it, it's an interesting point as to, as to where where the new housing is coming from that is affordable. Okay. Um, I don't want to rush everybody, but we are sort of slightly slipping behind on time. So we've got some recommendations. One is to that we note this report, which we will. Um, second one is to that that um we would like to a report back when we when, after we've had an inspection and we don't know when that might be it would be quite useful to get a a, a an update on what's come out of that that uh, inspection um and then the third one is an update on uh, on on the tenant satisfaction survey which we've discussed and following on from councillor johnson's point um we want to see whether we can increase the number of people who are actually responding. So 10% looks like it's a minimum. Obviously, the more you can get, the the better, the better the uh, the, the scope of the replies, isn't it? We get, we get a better flavour, really. Yeah, that... Chair, it was particularly especially to increase the number of subsites on the back of discussions, age range, geogra geography, um, disabilities, etc. Okay, can you pick up on that, Liz? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think that was it, unless we've got any other recommendations we want to make. Could, could we possibly see where, they, you know, we've had 977 replies. Could that be broken down into where they've come from and the age range at the moment? Because we will have that information, Chair, so that would be useful. Yeah, Angela. Angela. I'll double check, but I don't think we can break it down in that way because I didn't. I don't think we. I don't think we specified that this time. I'll double check, but I don't think we can do that. You know, back into our pre-meeting discussion, we said about the sample size. So, is this basically the survey of these unhappy people or all of generally people that they have taken part? What is this actually, Sam? It's. It's all it's all tenants, um, and so uh, and then a, a random sample is then selected. Um, but just to point out on the question about complaints, it's of people that have made a complaint. So some of the questions then drill down and only focus on people that have made a complaint. So it's a bit nuanced, I guess. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Right, so we've got some recommendations there, haven't we? Perfect. Well, thanks very much for that. So if we can just have a five minute break and can we make sure it's five minutes? So we'll come back here at 12.
12 minutes to.
try and keep it brief. Right, uh, we're going to keep going, please. Um, five minutes has become ten minutes, Thank you. as seems to be the case with this committee. So we are now going to item number five, which is fuel poverty, insulation, and energy efficiency. So I don't know whether. Okay. Um, so. I think, um, Helen, you're going to present, aren't you? Um, I don't want to sort of cut any corners, but if you can keep the presentation before, your presentation as succinct as possible, and then we've got more time for questions, because uh, we've got another another one after this. Thank you very much. All right, thank you again. Okay, so I'll be brief. Um, around a, Around a third of our social housing stock are 70 to 80 years of age, um, so therefore built in the in the sort of 50s. That's that's around three and a half thousand houses. This brings a challenge when it comes to achieving high energy efficiency ratings that we aspire to achieve. <clears throat> that said, around 63%, which is over seven and a half thousand of our stock, achieve achieve grade C or higher. Um, and a good number of our stock only require small changes, i.e. LED light bulbs or um, insulation, thermal insulation in the roof to achieve a higher grade. And that we, we are working on that as we speak. Um, additionally, we have a number of older buildings like Beck Hill in Bridlington and Deira Court in Driffield that are deemed to be beyond economical adjustments to reach those grades. So those are going to be demolished later this year and rebuilt into more modern, more efficient buildings. Um, and as I say, I'm trying to be brief. Additionally, this authority has embarked on a really ambitious project to spend around three million a year for three years to replace all or as many of our um, double glazed windows as necessary to install more efficient UPVC windows and window frames and doors. Um, and that's just me reading between the lines and I'll leave it at that and hand over to Helen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Helen McKeegan. I work in asset strategy in the housing investment team. Um, so just to give you a bit more of the background um, to this presentation, we the housing strategy sets out the uh, housing stock makeup in the area. And there's approximately 160,000 dwellings in the East Riding of Yorkshire, um, where 30 percent of those were built before 1945 um, and 75% of households are owner occupiers and 15% privately renting and 10% in affordable housing. Um, those figures are taken from the 2011 census. Um, checking the 2021 figures, we can see that the number of households that are privately renting has gone up to 17%, and the number of households that are owner occupiers has gone down to 74%. So you can see there is a gradual trend um, towards an increase in the private rented sector. Um, and we just have to be aware through the housing strategy of keeping these housing conditions under review. Um, and targeting our uh, resources as a council to properties that need it most and to households where we can help them um, to ensure that they live in a warm and uh, affordable home. Um, so looking at the matter of fuel poverty, uh, there is some um, data available at the local authority level, and this shows that nearly 15% of households that are in fuel poverty compared to 17.5% for households in the Yorkshire and the Humber region. Um, the definition of fuel poverty does relate to um, whether or not your property is classed as energy efficiency in terms of energy efficient in terms of its energy performance certificate. Um, and if you live in a property that's rated a D or below, um, and then you also look at your income and that those two things put together would define that you are classed as being in fuel poverty. So can we just move on to the next? Uh, no, yes, this slide, that's fine. Um, so the housing revenue account for council housing um, looks at just council housing. We manage and maintain 11,250 rented properties. Of those, just under 10,000 are classed as general needs housing. Um, mm -hmm. We have nearly 800 dwellings for older people. These will be our bungalow schemes. And 562 dwellings are classed as sheltered or supported housing. Supported housing is for people that have um, adult social care needs, so, so there are sort of extra care housing schemes. Um, so 79% of council dwellings have an energy performance certificate um, for, against their, stored against their property. 
63% of these are rated A to C and 37% are rated D to G. So just to give you a bit of context on the energy performance certificate and what that means, um, since 2008, rental properties have been required to have an EPC at the, at the letting stage. So as a landlord, we make sure that there is a current EPC, which is less than 10 years old, held against the property, which is given to the tenant when we relet it. So they can see what the energy performance of that property is and where potential improvements could be made. There's no requirement for us to store an EPC against a property that has not become empty since 2008. Um, so we do collect that information for our own purposes um, and around it being able to target our investment. Um, so that helps us to identify where the properties are in the worst condition and where we could improve, make improvements. Um, so 63% are rated A to C, as I say, and 37% are rated D to G. So when we do look at our funding and our investment, we do try and target the, the D to Gs first to try and get them up, at, up to a C level as quickly as possible. So of the 11% of properties that do not have an EPC, the council is currently collecting information on these properties. Um, EPCs are not the only source of data uh, that the council holds, and they can go out of date very quickly. As soon as some work is carried out on the property, the EPC changes, and unless you request a new EPC at that time, um, then you are storing out of date information. So we try and overlay the EPC data with our other um, information on stock condition. So that includes our um, stock condition survey that we carry out on a rolling basis and also our capital investment data. Um, every year we invest significant funds of money into our re-roofing program or our window program, new doors, new heating systems, et cetera. So by adding that in, we can actually update the EPC um, to get a new deemed uh, EPC rating. So the, the, the official one might say a D, but we know on our records it's above that. Um, so the, the ones that are a D, we've looked at those, and a lot of those can actually become a C by just doing minor works to them. So that could be um, topping up the loft insulation or um, fitting low energy um, LED light bulbs. Um, so that's quite a simple way for the council to bring those properties up to a, a C rating. So I'll just hand over to Angela to talk a little bit about, about what we're doing in the private rented sector. Thanks, Helen. And um, obviously, Helen set the context in terms of um, percentages um, of properties across the East Drive in 10 UIs. Private rented sector can be one of the more challenging areas in terms of improving energy efficiency. Um, there's been a lot of really good work from the private sector housing team um, to focus on um, the legal requirements and landlords must ensure a minimum EPC rating of E for their properties. Um, and we identified, as it says on the slide, 622 properties that failed to meet that, um, that minimum standard. The team have done really good work with private landlords and they've managed to reduce that number of um, non-compliant properties down to 131 by working proactively and supporting landlords to know what they need to do. But we are now at the enforcement stage where we're looking at taking legal action uh, where landlords haven't um, complied. Um, but we do, as I say, look to support landlords and we provide information, seminars, et cetera, to make landlords aware of the requirements. And just um, anybody that's not seen an air source heat pump, um, just one of the measures that we're looking at for some of the properties that we're, that we're dealing with and where we are making improvements, um, and Helen maybe talk about a little bit about this later on, but just um, just wanted to include that. Um, that's the sort of measure that we're, we're including. In terms of owner-occupied properties, there are a, a whole um, range of options that are available, and I won't go through them in detail because I'm conscious that we're short of time. They are included in the report, but I think what what the point I probably would try and cover is that we get a lot of different um, government um, funding arrangements, and we need to make sure that we target those um, based on the criteria. So sometimes they're aimed at um, the really poorly um, energy efficient properties where or they might be targeted to particular uh, tenant groups, maybe to older people, people on low income. So we make sure that we we really target that. And through the support that we've had um, through looking at the um, cost of living crisis and the group that we have, there's been some additional funding that the council um, has put through um, to make insulation measures available to owner occupiers as well. They make a contribution, but um, they do um, 
they do get some grant funding. So I'll just whip through these slides because they just do cover, as is in the report, some of the range of measures that we've been able to um, to put in place. Um, and as I said, we're always looking to make sure that we're exter accessing external grant funding so that we can make our funding um, go further. And just on this slide, the Household Support Fund, um, again, government funding has been made available previously to improve um, central heating um, into into properties. So we're always looking at um, how we can how we can access funding. But I'll hand back to Helen just to talk a little bit more about our council house initiatives. Yeah. So um, as Angela says, so in the report there is some information in there. What we tend to do is we take a fabric first approach. Um, towards improving our properties. So this gets the property ready for the switch over from um, fossil fuel heating, from gas central heating, um, to perhaps more electric type heating so from the heat pumps. Because um, it's making sure that the property doesn't um, lose any of its heat through the um, through the walls and through the roof. So we do look at an, uh, a fabric first approach to improving our, our council dwellings um, to prepare it for the future um, and for the net zero uh, target of 2050. So this slide just sets out the um, nature of works that we undertook in 2022, 20, uh, sorry, 23, 24. So this current financial year. Um, so that just gives you an idea of how, how many heat pumps we fit and, and how many re properties we re-roof. Re um, so in the budget that was recently approved um, by full council, we have committed um, 11 and a half million pounds through the four year financial plan for 24, 2024 to 28, and that that's for energy efficiency improvement works. So that's in addition to um, capital budgets that we have also committed to continue um, to do with the re-roofing, the heating, the windows, other measures uh, and improvements that help to keep the the property um, warm for the for the resident. Um, so we've we've got a project group that we've look, we're looking at how we can spend that money and what projects we can sort of target that towards. And currently we've, we've been looking at um, how we can sort of put PV onto properties that have been recently re-roofed re or are going to be part of the roofing programme. This is the most efficient way um, to do to put PV on the roof because um, it's when you've got the scaffolding up. So you, it reduces costs than having to go back and do it later at a later date. Um, so th those properties uh, that have been re-roofed in, in the last 10 years have been built to sustain the um, capacity of the PV and it's the type that's embedded in the roof as a roof tile. Um, so that's one of the uh, examples that we're doing and we're also looking at electric storage heaters and where um, we have air source heat pumps where we can add PV to the roof as well if they've recently been re-roofed um, to help bring those costs down of running those heating systems. So um, let's see that's that from that side yeah. So in total, um, we have at the moment nearly 500 properties that have the photovoltaic panels. Um, so it's just the one before that one, sorry. Uh, photovoltaic panels or solar thermal fitted and 680 properties are fitted with an air source heat pump. Um, so this additional funding, as I mentioned, we will be fitting those panels in um, and we'll be looking at um, where the tenants can benefit from their reduced cost of their electricity by having those fitted on the roof. Um, and the government has committed mon money through the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, and we're just waiting for the next round of that to be released so we can see what um, what the criteria is for that. The current um, programme, we did look at entering into a bid um, with a very experienced contractor, but the costs were, were much higher than we could do the works for ourselves, um, so we didn't submit a bid for that one. So this is just an example of uh, where our... Um, our housing maintenance team have gone into a, an empty property and identified some damp and mould that's um, formulated while in the property and it turned out to be as a result of the failing um, loft insulation. It can be um, if tenants have stored items in the loft, which we tell them not to do, it, it can compress it, um, which obviously makes it less um, useful, but also can cause problems as seen on that slide. So. Um, so we are looking at um, when properties are empty as part of this additional funding that I mentioned, um, we have amended the void checklist. So we're looking to do all these additional items uh, on the slide as part of that checklist to um, to try and improve the energy efficiency rating of the property. And when we do carry out any works, we do then get a new EPC, which means that when the tenant moves in, they get the, the most up to date 
information about the property that are renting from us and um, all the benefits of, of the work that we've carried out. So just to conclude, um, so minimising fuel poverty for residents is a priority for the council. Uh, as Angela mentioned, we have significant um, schemes for the private sector and also for ourselves in with council housing. Um, the housing strategy team uh, is responsible for putting together the overarching housing strategy um, and they're looking to update the affordable warmth strategy, which is the document that will pull all this together across all 10 years so that it will be visible um, for all parties to, to see it, all the work that's going on that the council is undertaking. Okay. Thank you very much, Helen. That was uh, Anne Angela for a very comprehensive uh, report. I just wonder... Just turn your mic off, can you, Gary? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I just wonder whether you can just give me an indication of how how we know in the in the private sector which houses are rented out as opposed to which which are lived in by owner occupiers because i I'll, do we target the ones that are rented out in the private sector for for um making sure that they're up to the high better standard of uh, epc so um it's not always easy to know where we've got private rented properties um, in terms of, of having the data, but we do we are targeting the private rented sector because we know that that contains, contains some of the poorest conditions. So the private sector housing team, as I mentioned, um, have got data about properties and know the ones where they've are only EPCE and those that we wanted to target. So, um, so that is absolutely what we've we've done to try and make sure we're improving standards there. I think in terms of the owner occupied sector, we try to make sure we try and make sure that we publicise all of the options that are available and that we work with um, other organisations so we can get referrals of people that might benefit from from those improvements. So, I suppose there's two there's two approaches. There can be um, grants and and other things that private landlords can access as well so again obviously if that's appropriate we would we would do that but it's not i suppose going back to your, your first point it's not always easy to know where the private rented properties are and those that are in owner occupation we're very clear about our own stock and where that sits obviously thank you councillor needham uh, thank you mr chair um a couple of questions there one on um council property and one on private um properties there um firstly on the council properties where we've installed um, PV, is this a cost-effective way uh, to improve the stats, so to speak, on those houses? Because it's it's generally quite an expensive upfront cost, and I'm just wondering what the payback is, whether the resident benefits directly from, obviously, the savings potentially in the electricity generated there. Um, and then secondly, in the private sector... <laughs> Um, where on 2.6, where we identify people who are struggling um, with um, fuel poverty there, it states that where it's identified that they're vulnerable in that respect, but where they have an old boiler, there is no aid available. And I'm just thinking that obviously that's going to be less efficient. It's going to cost them more. Um, we don't know about the fabric of the building as well. I'm just wondering what availability they have for support as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of the PV, um, there isn't any funding that we can get for the capital cost of um, installing the PV on the road. So, um, but it does lift the, it's one of the easiest ways to lift the um, energy rating of the property up. It's a, It can be worth about 15, um, points on the out of 100 on the SAP score, the standard assessment procedure score. Um, so yes, it, it's it, it, as a way of us enabling us to reach that target that all our um, council dwellings are an EPC C or above by 2035 or 2030 for fuel poor households. Um, it, it does help us to get to that target. Uh, it's the, the least invasive measure as well, because we may have some properties where tenants have refused works. Um, they don't want to have their old electric storage heater ripped out and, a, um, and an air source heat pump fitted. So that, that can be the reason why we still have some quite low 
rated dwellings that um that we that we manage you know that are sort of perhaps an e rating or an f rating um and that can only be done when that tenant moves out if they've refused that work you know many times because we do go back to them just in case they've changed their mind we do sort of go back and ask them again a year later do they do they still not want it um but yeah as a least invasive measure as an easiest measure when the roof is being um when, it, when property is being re-roofed because like i say we have the scaffolding up anyway um and the tenant benefits um as well so it's it's a, we see it as a good a good um measure you know because the tenants do benefit from the um the, the free electricity if they're using their appliances when the sun's shining um we're not putting battery storage with it at the moment that would be the only way that you could ensure that you you know kept that energy that was generated for that individual property so some of the energy does get exported back to the grid um, but the tenant can apply for um, through their utility provider for the um, smart export guarantee so they can get a, a, you know a, quite a beneficial tariff um, for doing that okay thank you very much for that councillor johnson sorry sorry I was, Sorry, Chair, I was just going to pick up the second question, which I think related to 2.6. It is right that that scheme is prioritising people that don't have systems that are working or don't have a system at all. Um, I mean, we would all we would always look to see whether there were other opportunities that we could sign for those people, so, or even those benefit checks. But you're absolutely right, it is, um, that is the priority that we place at the moment. So they wouldn't get anything, they wouldn't get assistance unless they fell under some other auspice. With absolutely, yeah. And sorry, just going back to the PV panels then. So do we have, is there a, a programme where we can um, ascertain we've got value for money for it? Because I'm all for green energy, put them on every house. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But the cost is obviously prohibitive in times. Yeah. But how, how do we know that we're getting value for money for that? That was really the other point of the question. Yeah. Um, so we've got some monitoring equipment on some properties at the moment. So that will help, help us to determine that we're fitting the right size of PV onto the roof because if you oversize it then um then yes there'll be there'll be more power generated but it will go back to the grid and which is a, which is a part of the government strategy as well to th these little micro generation uh, systems or, or how we're you know looking to get our energy sources in the future um but um so but we want to as a landlord as we're not getting any capital money from the government to put them on we want to ensure we put the, the the right size on so we're not oversizing it so the monitoring equipment which we've, we've got on at the moment will tell us over the course of a full year um you know how different households live different sizes in different types of properties and then when if we do roll it out further we can ensure we fit the best uh, best one on ideally we would access funding from the government from the social housing decarbonization fund so this is where we're, we're getting our monitoring information and then when that next wave opens wave three hopefully they'll have learned some of the feedback because i don't believe it's been that popular um with people putting bids in so um so they need to look at the criteria and see if they can make it a little bit easier um for for providers like ourselves to access it um and make make it more cost effective as well yeah okay thank you councillor johnson so can i have a wiggle on that as well what about battery storage i can't did you mention the battery storage are we, yeah are we actually put in battery storage into not, houses uh, not considering it at the moment um as i say that is a, that is something that again is an extra cost to us as a landlord that we would have to fund um and without the funding from the government um you know it is it is difficult we, you know we have to sort of look at our all our stock and make sure that we're targeting our resources um to ensure that they're all meeting the decent home standard and you know with the report angela brought earlier about the regulator mm -hmm. and um, the extra pressures that we've got on the housing revenue account business plan. Um, you know, we, we have to we have to make some of these decisions, but that's not to say if batteries, the price comes down in the future, it might be something we want to consider in the future. Um, the target is 2050 at the moment, you know, to, to decarbonize um, our stock. So uh, it is something that we need to keep an eye on in terms of the industry as a whole and, and any other potential new innovative technology that might come in that might help us to achieve that target. Okay, thank you. Can I ask another question? So, so we have adopted the future homes standard for our new builds, builds which is yeah. great news, fantastic yeah. news, etc. Um, what about private 
builders though are, are, are we trying to encourage them to do the same thing um i think that's more for the local plan um question for their uh, for the for the planning policy team i think they did recently through the revisions to the local plan they have um put some design standards into that um but the uh, the future home standard is part of the building regulations and um, as I understand it, they're still at the consultation stage, so it may not actually come in in 2025 for all new housing, which was the original intention. Um, so it might be something that's a little bit further down the line. Um, but yeah, certainly as a council for our own housing, we've we've adopted that as our energy strategy. So my, my question was really with regard to, because we do buy houses, don't we, that have not yes. been sold on the open market. Yeah. Would we be looking, obviously, more favourably at houses to buy for our housing stock, yeah. for our tenants, yeah. if they were built to if those they were built to those standards? standards. Yeah, um, yeah, it would be a good thing. Um, obviously, anything that had, um, you know, those sorts. Of, if they had the space standards as well as the energy standards that we want to apply to our own new builds, then that is a good thing. We we, do, we don't tend to find many private developers that are building to those yet, because if they don't have to. Um, they wouldn't, you know, it's, um, but it is something that is, as I say, it's a government building regs thing that is looking to improve all stock in the future. But at the moment, we're not seeing them being built, um, you know, to that advanced standard, if you like. But when they're mandated to do it, I'm sure they will. They'll, they'll have to. So. Okay. So that's a good reason for us to be building our own. Yeah, houses, definitely. Isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It does seem extraordinary that every new house that's built in the country doesn't have all of that. Yeah. You know, I, I don't understand why we're retro, retrofitting rather than yeah. doing so at the time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Councillor Duke. Thank you, Chair. Um, just one question. I, I seem to miss the, on your um, upgrades on your existing properties, and I, I understand it's building regulations for new houses. Under floor insulation, uh, do you ever factor that in, in terms of timber floors? Because I've and it, it's got two values to that. It's got an insulation property, and also it has a, if you get the right products, you can use it for uh, noise abatement if you're in the block of flats. So I wondered if you've got provision for that. Yeah, it's not one of the um, items that we've picked out initially, but we are at the very early stages of looking at how we can target this additional funding, uh, the 11.6 million that I mentioned that we've got over four years. Um, so I think the, the underfloor heat, uh, underfloor insulation, as I understand it, is can lift the SAP score by two or three points. So it's not as big as um, some of the other measures that we mentioned. I think um, the cavity wall and the, the roof void are obviously our, um, our main priority at the moment. And we do have, um, you know, quite a big programme to look at properties that have cavity wall insulation to sort of check that the insulation hasn't slumped or is filled with the most appropriate material because sometimes you'd get a lot of builders rubble put into the cavity so all of that needs investigating with a boroscope and that takes time and then we can you know if we find one or two in a street that have that problem we can then look to take that old insulation out and fill it with new um but these are all projects that we're identifying as we're going along um but yeah certainly um the it, you're right it does it does help especially in flats with the noise insulation and when we do our retrofitting of our flats uh, that, like at Eastgate in Gaul or our um, sheltered housing schemes in Hornsey um, they will all be built to the modern um, standards for for all of the insulation and, and sound insulation as well yeah okay Councillor White thank you chair okay um, just looking at the report on section two two point two if anybody wants to take a look. Um, it says in November 2021, further to a successful bid to the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, 2.3 million was awarded to aid with the improvement of 100 off gas network properties. And then at the end, uh, the last sentence, further to the cost of living crisis and cost of, of electricity, there was a low uptake by residents and the number of households aided reduced to 65. So I was just wondering, what was it that wasn't appealing to those residents to take take that offer up? Because when you've worked hard to, to get that money um, and then they don't take it, what was off-putting? Thank you. Um, that's a really, a really good question. And I know the team really worked hard to try and make sure we could maximise the funding. I think... 
Um, for some people, it was the uncertainty and unknown around um, moving across to a, a totally different system and air source heat pumps. I think there was a, a reticence there for some people to proceed. So we had quite a lot of people who inquired and then didn't continue with their application. But I think, again, when we were doing some of those installations, it was when um, fuel costs, energy costs generally, were, were sky high and people could see the electricity costs going up and they were worried about moving to a new system where they didn't know what the monthly costs would be and how they'd be able to budget for them. So I think there was it was unfortunate timing, I think, for us. I think the team did really well, actually, to get 65 in because this was a national issue about take-up as well. So it was a combination of the factors, uncertainty around costs and moving across to a completely new system. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Paul, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, 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 please, if I can. Um, regarding the um, section on Voidworks 314, um, obviously there's something I've been involved in for the last 10 years. Um, I have to just ask the question, I, not just myself, but I know some of my um, tenant colleagues who undertake void inspection um, um, voids to do, um, we have, well, we, we understand the um, complexities around the damp and mould and all the pressures that it's, it's brought onto the council uh, and extra work. I do have reservations about the possibly over-reliance on the use of paint, anti-mold paint, resistant paint. And the reason I say this is um, it's an easy fix. Um, I'll, you know, I, I'd like to see some guarantees that all the checks have been done in place before this is applied because I get the impression on the ground that because, because obviously, do you, you want to get the voids quickly turned over? But that's understandable, and they have time scales, and there's all different logistics issues that sometimes this be, might be done as a quick fix. Going back to earlier um, this morning when we was talking about the um, the tenant satisfaction surveys and the area regarding complaints. We need to get these jobs done right first and new tenant coming in and then getting a complaint. So like I say, it's not just me, but I have reservations about the use of um, the paint, the mold paint being used, as over-reliance on it. I'll, 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 I'll just um, answer that initially and Jeff, I think, wants to come in as well. I mean, you're absolutely right, Paul. Um, we need to make sure we're diagnosed. If we've got damp and mold in a property, we need to make sure we're diagnosing it properly, and we don't want we don't want any quick fixes. I think as part of the void process, and to make sure we're not building in, you know, too much additional time um, before we're able to relet the properties. I think it can be a measure alongside the other things that we're doing to make sure we've got appropriate heating, ventilation, insulation, etc., in the property. So I think you're absolutely right. It's not a quick fix, and it can't be used to to cover up. But as part of a a suite of measures it can be it can be a useful tool and can and can sort of um make sure that that that, that there isn't a mold growth particularly in kitchens and bathrooms but jeff might want to add no, thanks for the question paul um i think as angela mentioned it, it is one measure and it's only one measure there's there's a lot more other measures as we've mentioned about insulation etc cetera, etc cetera, which is important that we look at the, the entirety of the property make sure it's uh fit for standards uh, and uh, the, the new tenant is satisfied and uh, you know we deal with the issues when it's void as opposed to when it's occupied because it's easier to deal with the issues when it's void as you're aware um i think that um just for uh, members uh, benefit the the regulator has has looked at this and and said also it's a balance between making sure our property is safe and secure and the turnaround of the, of the property so it's that balancing act all the time because obviously we've got people on the waiting list and in housing need, but also at the same time we want to ensure that you know the property is a, a very good standard when it when we let it. So it's that balancing act all the time. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um Councillor Sarable. Thank you, Chair. 
So um, my question was, uh, so recently we attended the carbon literacy uh, training, like past few weeks in actually here. So, um, and then one of the main, uh, you know, emissions is housing and then the transport. So what kind of um, figures do you have or how you are looking at these climates, uh, you know, net carbon, carbon literacy, carbon footprint in your um, housing? Yes, thank you. Do you mean council housing or all housing? Yeah. More part, more particular council housing. So like, yeah, so do you have any data and how are we doing in terms of, you know, being climate conscious and yeah. doing this? Yeah, so I think all of this report really sort of sets out what we're doing to reduce our carbon footprint. So um, it's how we can make the homes as energy efficient as possible so that there isn't any um, or as little waste as possible from them. Um, and then, as I mentioned, to get them ready for the um, transition from the fossil fuels to um, to you know other forms of heating, such as heat pumps. Um, so the, we wouldn't just put a heat pump in and then not be looking at the air loss from the property. That that wouldn't be the right thing to do because the, the tenant would need to keep you know sort of having it on more than they you know would otherwise have to if the property was properly insulated so it is looking at this stage looking at the fabric first measures that we can do so how we can improve the fabric of the property the, the envelope of it and um, to reduce the heat loss and then it's ready for the switch over to the um the other technology uh, in the future if that's the route that the, the country is going down as we move away from fossil fuels Sorry, Chair, just to follow up on that. So how challenging do you find the properties in East Riding with these? Um, you know, I heard there is a lot of challenges with this climate conscious and obviously it's going to cost a lot yeah, for us. Yeah, how do you? Cost, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. So we've, we've estimated a cost in our four year. Um, well, it's a, we do a 30 year financial business plan um, and we took some figures from SIPFA, which is the um, public finance accountants uh, body. So they had done some work to estimate what, what it could cost um, for, for landlords, social landlords to, um, to meet the targets that, that are being set. Um, and it, you know, it is eye-watering sums of money that we're looking at over the 30-year program. So we've taken that figure and, and put it into our business plan. Um, and you know, this first four years, we've got 11.6 million to spend. Um, and it's about we can develop the projects and you know look to where we can make some efficiencies and then you know sort of roll that out and extend it further over over the next you know sort of 20 plus years really um, but it's yeah it's not a quick fix it is going to be a long-term project that we'll be doing this for yeah definitely okay I've got just two, two more questions Councillor Johnson did you want to come back no it's Councillor Smith um, I read when I was reading this report, there was something that jumped out at me. So I'm, I'm not going to be critical. Actually, is 3.4. I've I thought that was really interesting with the work you're doing on properties that are off the gas network. I'm assuming, given the geography of the East Riding, we've got many social properties that are dotted around little villages, be it Bishop Wilton or Wheel or whatever. Um, and so trying to get these guys away from the, the fuel and the fossil fuel, is that a key aim of the, the authority? It is, yes, and you're right. So the off-gas properties, the options are limited for, for our tenants. So a lot of them are on the, the oil-fired central heating systems or the solid fuel. Um, we have um, a few that are still on solid fuel and oil, but not many. Um, and again, that, a lot of that comes down to choice. So a bit like the tenants that are on electric storage heaters as well, or, or even electric heaters, um, they they are offered the upgrade to the air source heat pump. Um, but if they refuse it, then it's work that we will do when the property becomes void to change it to to this alternative um, heating source. But yeah, it, it is. We do. You're right. We do have a lot of properties on the rural areas that fall into that category. Yeah. So, so would it be fair for me to, to say that those rural areas, these sorts of projects where we're going solar heat pumps, th th there is a kind of priority when, when you go into a void in, in one of those areas to, to get them greener and, and away from the fossil fuels? Yes, certainly. So what, um, the air source heat pump has been a, um, a contract that we've been running for a number of years. Um, we've just recently retended it and um, we've gone with a new contractor, actually, who is you know, quite significantly lower than the previous one. Um, so that should enable us to do more for the, for the budget. 
Um, but yes, so, so we'll continue to offer the air source to uh, uh, through that program. But as well as that, because we've got this additional money now, we can do other things such as the PV on the roof, which we weren't doing previously, um, if it's been re-roofed in the last 10 years. Um, or we could maybe look at a project to bring some forward in a street, you know, that are maybe 25, 28 years, you know, maybe try and bring them forward um, to have them done. Um, so it's about trying to maximise all, all the funding streams together. And, and we have representatives from our building facilities team who run those plan programmes. And we have representatives from Jeff's housing maintenance team um, all sitting around the table with ourselves in asset strategy, coming up with ideas um, and to how to spend this money. So definitely makes sense to do to do it as much as we can at, all at once when we're when we're doing major works. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you, thank you very much to Angela and to Helen, Helen for a very interesting uh, update on where we are. Um, recommendation wise, I mean, a is to thank thank Angela and and. And Helen for their contribution and secondly um, that we would receive updates on the fuel poverty insulation energy efficiency with maybe at the same time an update on what fundings become available and what monies we are spending as we go forward thank you very much sorry yes we've got another one here I was just gonna, can we can we commend our officers for the work they're doing in trying to um, ensure that we are um, mitigating climate change effects as much as possible I think they're to be applauded by the work that they're doing. Yeah, we've got that, yeah. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to our final item. I don't want any, no one is to leave the room. We've got to set up the, um, the David. <laughs> That'd be a school, wouldn't it? You must be passing this group. You must go over and go, it's like, oh, pants. <laughs> I know. You need to bring a colleague with you, don't you? you know, otherwise, one of your livestock father friends. Well, you can normally go around with livestock and give them a bit of a hit with a stick, you know. <laughs> did, you, did they just give you everybody who's got a weird, strong opinion? That's well, I'm sure there are lots of others who have as well. I've brought some other committees. They're much quieter than this. Are they? Maybe I'll just let people get away with it too. Yeah. Meredith here as well. I mean, well, uh, at least we haven't got Meredith here because otherwise we, we, we wouldn't have got past item one yet. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay, so the final item today is modern the modern slavery policy. Um, so um, I'm delighted to have David Barlow here and Hannah and Matthew. Um, who are going to present today, and uh, I'll pass it on to you, David. I just quickly want to make sure that Barbara's still there, and um, it, it's not a, an avatar or anything. You haven't asked any questions yet, but uh, I've no doubt you're listening in, because you're always very good at that sort of thing. Okay, great. Okay, David, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so my name's Dave Ball, and I work for the East Riding Safeguarding Adults Board. Um, which is an associated board, a partnership board between sort of um, um, yourselves as the council, um, the uh, NHS and the police. We're sort of like a, an oversight board uh, around sort of adult safeguarding. Um, so what I'm here to do today is just present the modern slavery policy refresh. So ASAB are the lead partner in terms of um, modern slavery. So what we've done is we've worked together with um, officers from the local authority to um, help refresh your um, modern slavery policy, um, which which is um, I think it was was last uh, refreshed in 2017. So it was due um, a refresh. So I've got a presentation which I will share with yourselves, and uh, we will go through.
Sorry about that. One second. There we go. So, um, start off by saying that modern slavery is closer than you think, despite what people may think. They may think it's uh, something that happens in, uh, in in other countries. It's not. It's happening in this country. It's happening um, across the East Riding. It will be happy and happening in um, in Beverly. It might actually also be uh, be happening um, down your street. Um, Quick little bit of background. So in, in terms of modern slavery, um, it, that's just an umbrella term encompassing slavery, servitude, forced or compulsory labour, um, human trafficking. Um, and if you look at the Equality and Human Rights Commission, there's sort of like different definitions that they provide. So there, there's definitions of human trafficking, sexual exploitation, forced labour, domestic servitude, organ harvesting and um, criminal exploitation. So why? Why are we refreshing the, pol the, the, the policy? Why is the re refresh needed? Well, I also already mentioned that the last time it was sort of refreshed was 2017. So since 2017, um, there's, there has been changes to uh, government legislation around um, modern slavery. Um, but I think more, more importantly is to reflect some of the growing and strengthening partnership areas that are that are happening across the East Riding with regards to, to modern slavery. And I'll take questions about any of those sort of partnership activities um, at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So as with, with um, any other policy that, that, that would be brought to this group, the, there are links to, to other policies within um, the local authority, and you can see some of them there. Um, I would point you probably towards the sort of like uh, the bottom right, the serious violence duty response strategy, which I, I'm not going to talk about, but um, Matthew may want to to say something about that um, in response to, to questions uh, at the end of the policy. Oh, sorry, the end of the presentation. Um, with regards to the local authority then, so, so very, very briefly, and to give sort of like a high level view, what are sort of like the local authority's duties in terms of modern slavery? So that would include the identification and referral of victims, the actual supporting uh, victims. So that might be through safeguarding adults, for example, uh, safeguarding uh, children, um, through housing and homelessness services, links to the national referral mechanism, um, those sort of things. Um, linked into that, you've got the community safety services and disruption uh, activities. And then if you look at the council, particularly as a, uh, a commissioner of services, it would be looking uh, the, for the local authority to ensure that their supply chains and procedures are free from um modern slavery. So in, in examining the policy um, and looking at the policy outcomes, this is sort of like a high level of what the policy is looking to, to, to achieve. So it, should the policy be adopted, um, what would happen is um, there would be the establishment of modern slavery policy delivery group, which will deliver the outcomes of the policy. Um, so part of the um, policy is that they will look at uh, commit to the local authority would commit to undertaking the local government as, uh, association um, modern slavery maturity matrix. So what this is, this was created by the local government association, and it's a self assessment tool basically. So in undertaking that tool, it sort of it, it it gives the local authority an idea of where the where they are, where there may be gaps, and ways ways to sort of like minimise those gaps and uh, improve things. Um, it what the another outcome of the policy would be to establish a modern slavery, um. Uh, member champion. So um, for those of you who are aware around things like, say, for example, the Armed Forces Covenant, there's an Armed Forces Covenant um, champion member. Um, so it would be it would be useful to have a, a dedicated member who who was there in terms of looking at things in, 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 and getting involved in, in matters around uh, modern slavery. Um, 
it would also establish a named officer within um, the East Riding uh, local authority um, in terms of modern slavery. So there's there's a number of different departments um, within um, the local authority who, who are all involved in in some way with some things towards modern slavery. So that might be adult safeguarding, that might be children's safeguarding, that could be uh, public health, that could be um, offices uh, in the homelessness section, that could be offices in licensing and those sort of things. So what this would do is, there's all those different officers, but let's have a named officer, a single officer, who's sort of a, a coordinator, really, in, in regards to that. Um, so another another uh, outcome of the policy would be that um, it would design and deliver a new um, e-learning package around modern slavery, which would be delivered to all staff. So that would be compulsory in the in the same way that um, a, a, the equalities training is is compulsory, or in the same way that something like data protection uh, is compulsory for, to staff. So when a new staff member joined the local authority, it would be on their list of training packages that they would go and that they would they would take off to help improve that that sort of awareness. Um, Another uh, another outcome of the policy would be that um, we will collect and publish modern slavery statistics on a quarterly basis, and that would be through the East Riding um, Local Modern Slavery Forum, which is one of those partnership activities that I've talked about earlier in terms of what we've uh, what we've already um, achieved. So when we talk about um, modern slavery and statistics, um, we are given through our partnership uh, work information from homicide police. So that would include things like the number of live investigations that they've got around modern slavery at the moment, the number of intelligence reports which are going into homicide police around modern slavery, and the number of um, NRMs, National Referral Mechanism referrals that they are making um, uh, or, or that are being made in this area um, into the national system, which again is that indication of it's basically where someone has approached, um, it could be the police, it could be ourselves, um, have said they think they, they may be subject to modern slavery, uh, and with their consent, we would then refer them into the national uh, mechanism to help it, it take them out of the modern slavery situation that they're in. Um, and then uh, the, the final outcome there would be to produce an annual report, which would set out the activities and achievements and partnership work that had been undertaken by uh, the local authority and, and its uh, relevant partners um, each year. So it'd just be it's just it'd just be a good, nice, simple place to go to say well, what what's happening in terms of uh, modern slavery in the East Riding and how are they combating it? What's going on? So those sort of things. Um, I've included here a, a, a draft implementation time scale. So this is only draft, and this this is this is changeable and uh, movable. But um, just to give a sort of like a, a quick high level view of the next six months. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it would be you'd be looking at full council approval in June. Um, following month, we would establish a delivery group. So the delivery group will look at the policy uh, and um, create a, an action plan. Um, as part of the action plan, we'd be looking at the local authority undertaking the maturity matrix. So that would start in the August and probably take three months to complete. So again, the, the outcome of the um, modern slavery maturity matrix would then inform the delivery plan, which would be, hopefully be drafted in the January, and that it would look at all the previous points that I've um, talked about. So who's going to design the training, who's going to deliver the training, um, et cetera, et cetera, those, those sort of things. Um, I thought it was uh, important today, if I am going to talk about modern slavery, we talk about for everybody, not just not just members, not just officers, not just members of the public, but um, how do we actually report modern slavery? So um, what I would say on that is with absolutely everything, if you feel that someone is, as you would in any other scenario, if you feel that someone is at, at immediate risk, 
then it, it's very much a police matter and you're calling 999 straight away. Um, if you are um, deliver if you've got some some uh, information which you think might pertain to, to modern slavery, you can call 101. And there's also an online form which you can complete which you know, if you've got to, if you wanted to submit um, information to homicide police or regarding modern slavery, you can see there. There's also a couple of numbers. So there's a modern slavery helpline, um, and there's also um, Crime Stoppers there. But again, um, I, I would um, I would reinforce that if he's, if someone is at immediate risk, please dial nine nine nine. Um, just to give you sort of like a little bit of background, because I didn't want to come here to say, to, to, to deliver this to you today, and for it to be um, a little dry, um, and um, we don't know sort of like how what, what the outcome is going to be. So this is a couple of a couple of stories from um, the whole Daily Mail, so you can see which are which are based on cases within the um, the East Riding. So you can see um, the top one um, was around. Um, we, we we looked at the different types of modern slavery earlier and sexual exploitation. So this was a this was a, a lady who was brought across from um, Romania and was tra uh, trafficked to the to the East Riding to be to be used in sex work. So she presented herself to officers um, at Paragon Station in Hull, um, and then through the investigations and the work of the the uh, sort of like the modern slavery team in, uh, within Homicide Police, uh, it successfully led to the uh, prosecutions of uh, two two individuals there. In in terms of uh, soliciting uh, sex work, um, and then the the second story there again is around uh, criminal exploitation. So this was again around sort of like the creation of um, sort of cannabis farms within Hull and within Wivensey. Um, in in that case, um, so I appreciate that's a very very quick run through of modern slavery and the. The causes and, and and what we're doing about it, and I'm I'm now happy to take to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, uh, David. It's very interesting at the end there to bring out some live cases, just to see. You know, I suspect there's a lot of people sort of hiding in plain sight, if you like. There might be the ones we we might consider to be obvious, who might not be or might be, than the ones that we don't see. So yeah, very interesting and very interesting to the lead that we're taking as a council. So I've got a question from uh, Councillor Needham, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Very quickly there, really commendable policy. It's something that uh, I would fully support in Council when that was to come up. Um, the one question is, you mentioned that it would be available um, to train or would have to be compulsory for all staff, but it should also be for elected members so that we've got a full understanding of that if people are reporting back to this committee. So thank you. Well, I think that's maybe a recommendation we could make. Well, uh, it, it's maybe a recommendation we, I don't know what members think, whether we have a sort of a full, you know, all, all members should be um, made knowledgeable of this through some sort of training, not just this committee, but to all members. It's, it's a question of awareness, isn't it? rather than sort of not really knowing what it is but making sure we do yeah i mean one of the things um what another thing that i've actually brought with me today is the current modern slavery annual report which has been produced by airsap so that it will shortly be available um on the airsap website but that again talks about some of the stuff that we've done today but it also talks about modern slavery champions so this is something that we um launched within um, the East Ride across the East Riding in as part of Safeguarding uh, Week last June, and what a Safeguarding Champion is, it's a, sort of like a go-to person in in a team who who will share information, who will add, answer questions on, um, you know, uh, how how would I do, how would I respond to this circumstance, how do I make a referral, that sort of thing, and as part of that, we've trained and, and brought on board officers within the local authority, so that effectively, which is spread. So that effectively, um, 
each certainly each service area has got their own modern slavery champion now um who who will throw ourselves distribute information um and we deliver the trading costs as that as part of that and now again for for members it would be very very simple for us to deliver that sort of like same awareness course and it it was about an hour long to give you a time scale of sort of like how much member time it would take but again yeah as part of this we're we're happy to uh, to de- deliver uh, deliver a trading package to members Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for your report. Just a simple question that, and it's a very difficult question, this probably. Have we got any figures in monetary systems in, in terms of how much this is affecting the local black, the black economy affecting uh, this economically wise? Have we got any, any ideas of any? Um. What I would say with that, to to that is 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 no. Um, that is that is the the the, the high level um, question or, or answer. Um, through my basically, what one of the groups that we set up um, is is the um, the East Riding Local um, Modern Slavery Forum, and through that, that's a meeting with ourselves, with Humberside Police, with the fire service, with people like the gang masters and labor uh, abuse authority um sort of like all the interested parties of that and what we what we do as part of that group is we do um we do look at sort of like the the most prevalent types of uh, modern slavery across the east riding so i can tell you straight away that um they are sexual exploitation and labor exploitation so there's been there's been a lot of cases where um at the moment through ourselves and through groups like the adult sexual sexual exploitation subgroup we've been working to the, with the police to get into brothels and to give to provide support to to the people uh, in those brothels um but there's certainly been uh um cases as well where we've looked at labor exploitation and that has been things around sort of like possibly farm work uh, and that sort that sort of thing but also a, a more simpler level um one of the awareness campaigns that have been uh, run on the south bank which is quite interesting is really a sort of like an awareness campaign for members of the public and that's a series of posters where they've sort of like asked questions like who is who is doing your nails who's doing your hair who's using your food bank, who's delivering your takeaways, those sort of questions. But um, as with anything, to, I, I don't have a figure that I could put uh, put to yourself, unfortunately, in terms of the, you know, the, 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 what it is in terms of the, uh, um, the, you know, the, the value of it out there. I mean, to go back to one of those cases that I, that I mentioned where we were looking at the cannabis farms, um, when the police raided the cannabis farms, the cannabis, as part of that, had a street value of around three hundred thousand pounds. So that was just one sort of like um, case. There. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry, Matthew. Yeah, go on. Yeah, it's just to add to your question, Councillor. If we think um, thinking in a wider context of, of community safety, uh, Operation Shield that was. Um, was started last year by Humberside Police, particularly targeting Bridgeton South as a ward area. Around 60 nominals were arrested, five organised crime gangs. Um, well known, they publicise that and do a great job of publicising that out in, in Hull Live, etc. Humberside Police. But we consider here the criminal exploitation element within this report, such as county lines, actually some of the work that people have to do within county lines is very incredibly long days. Um, and that is open to exploitation as well. So the it's, what that operation has done is ripped the heart out of organised crime in Billington South. It may very well reappear, but it kind of shows that actually the economy of scale within an area that was allowed to have been developed. So intelligent-led, partnership working, intelligence-led investigations allows us to have these quite proactive responses to organised crime, criminal exploitation and modern slavery. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Sarabal. Thank you, Chair. So thank you for the presentation. Um, as a lecturer at University of Hull, we had a lot of these com- conversations about the modern slavery. 
And um, just to put a background on this, that we noticed that a lot of these modern slaveries is actually is not happening in the organizations or the institutions. It's actually right next door to us in streets, like where you see people who they are working in the car washes. Like I can name a lot of those Polish people or whoever of these are. Or you see a lot of these cheap workers that they work in the farms, you know, things that is our own benefit. But um the 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 important thing is we we actually see them on a daily basis but what we are doing about those or how we need to as a society or community yes we are aware of it but how are we going to tackle it how how this is going to you know make an impact rather than just keep saying all of these thank you thank you chair yeah i think i think awareness is the key because i think um if we're to sort of like talk about what, how you, you know there's, there's there are certain um sort of like things which we could do which is is around spotting the signs or how would you spot the signs how would you identify someone who is subject to 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 modern slavery um so again and this is just off the top of my head um in terms of uh, of sort of like um exploit labor exploitation they generally be disheveled they'd probably be quite withdrawn from so from talking to people that more than often would be seen with somebody else who would always do their talking for them they might not be able to identify where the address of where they work and they might not be able to identify the, their actual address of where they live as part of that they're literally trafficked from um property to workplace back to property type sort of thing um so it is about awareness um and over the coming year we have we have sort of like as part of our um, our our plan and um, we've refreshed the humble modern slavery partnership strategy so that was done last december um and we also had a day where we worked with homicide police Whole Safeguarding Adults Board, North and North East Link Safeguarding Adults Boards, um, to look at where the policing priorities were over the next year um, as well. And again, um, just in terms of that, um, they're going to be focusing on sexual exploitation, juvenile labour, domestic servitude and uh, care homes. Um, uh, so, so specifically, they've already set up a steering group around sort of like care homes and so doing that. So you mentioned um, the University of Hull as as well. So um, later this later this month, the Humber Modern Slavery uh, Partnership are having sort of like a a day where effectively they will have a stall at the uh, um, at the university where they're basically they're going to do a little bit of awareness around uh, modern slavery, which again w will improve things. Um, but it it, it might also help. Um, identify people who are currently studying at the university who might be subject to modern slavery in terms of some of some of the things that they're doing. Um, you, quite often you'll see um, uh, you'll see uh, where in terms of care homes and the care sector you'll see people who are sort of like the the promised sort of like a certain amount of work and the promised a you know a, a, a certificate to work here in the care sector and they come across and then they then become subject to sort of like um, labour exploitation. So again, it is an area of focus that we're looking at look, little things like that. But for me, everything is is about education and one of the things that this policy will do in terms of in terms of awareness will help improve aware, awareness awareness of everyone who works for the local authority. So that's 10,000 people, which is absolutely fantastic. And that's, but that's only a starting point. And then for our partnership work, we'll help spread that because I, um, I know through talking to my homicide police colleagues, what they do want to do is increase the amount of um, information referrals that come through to themselves. Um, if you look at sort of like the way the sort of like the, the, the figures are divided among uh, amongst the homicide police um, footprint, you sort of like, you've got sort of like hollow up by far at the top in terms of statistics around um, modern slavery and then we're somewhere further down. Doesn't mean that we're better at doing things, doesn't mean that um, there's less modern slavery across the East Riding. We just might not be um, reporting it as, as you know, as in a forthcoming matter as some of the other areas. So again, it's an awareness thing for, for me and that I hope. Awareness is a big part of this policy for members, for officers, and for members of the public. So hopefully um, the adoption of this will take that forward. Just a very quick one, because we need, we need to wind things up. Okay, just a quick one. So um, 
How about the private sectors then? Yes, as an organization, we are fully aware we are doing all our best. And as you said, like a very big organization like East Riding or university, et cetera. How about what enforcement or what, you know, sometimes just being aware of something is not going to be the, you know, the solution. So. Yeah, so in terms of enforcement action, that would be that would fall in sort of like um, under the uh, realm of the gang masters, labourer, uh, uh, and abuser uh, authority. So they are part of our uh, our uh, partnership. So they do come to the local events, they do come to the to the humber wide events, but it's down to them. So in, intelligence in terms of labour exploitation in. Um, in sort of like the private sector, the information would flow to them uh, as as it would to ourselves, and then they would do an investigation regardless of whether um, someone, you know, the company was a private or public sector um, organisation. Um, I just want to thank you, Mr Barlow, for a presentation on a subject that most of us probably don't know an awful lot about. You're clearly very passionate about the subject. And I think that's really important in such a, a, an issue that impacts our communities and the people around us. My question for you is really, really a, a simple one. I think you may have answered it. But in terms of the East Riding, are there any particular areas that are a hotspot for modern slavery? Or is it, if I'm right in listening to everything that's been said, this, you just can't put your finger on that? Uh, that's that's correct. It's it's very very difficult to pin down in terms of uh, hot spots. Um, like I said, if you look at sort of like the, the 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 two sort of like most prevalent types of modern slavery in the East Riding, that is sexual exploitation. So we know through some of the work that we've been undertaking with our uh, police partners that they know where the established brothels are, so it's easy for them to get into those um, and to to look at assisting people. There has been a particular problem around pop up brothels, and simply by their nature, they could literally be uh, an Airbnb that. That effectively a pimp has, has rented for a week who will who will establish a, a pop-up brothel and use it. So that could be anywhere. Um, in terms of labour exploitation, so that could be farm work, it could be factory work, again, could be anywhere within, within the East Riding. Um, and then in terms of sort of like at the lower end of the age scale, sort of like under 18s, you really see in, um, sort of like criminal exploitation in terms of, that might be in terms of things like um, gangs, gangs who would go sort of like shoplifting, basically. So again, it's very, very difficult um, to to pin down a particular area or a particular problem area because, because of its nature and because the, the East Riding is such a large rural authority as well. I think you just answered it for me there. I was going to say that given the geography of the, the county, this is just very, very difficult rather than being a tight urban environment. So thank you very much for your answer. I'm oh, sorry. Um, OK, we've got some recommendations. One, the first one is to thank uh, David, Matthew and Hannah for coming and presenting. And it's been very interesting for us to get an update on all that. Secondly, is that we... Uh, We'll be provided with a copy of the annual modern slavery report. And thirdly, that we should have some form of training for members, um, all members, not just members of this committee, um, on, on modern slavery. And the fourth one is that the consideration given to the council having a, a member champion for modern slavery. So that's maybe something we could think about as groups, see if, if there's somebody who might fit that bill or want to do that. And then the final one is uh, this is going to cabinet on the 19th of March and we need to approve it and be happy for it to do to go to cabinet. Are we happy with that? Yeah, absolutely. Could we mention something about which Liz already discussed about making the public more aware of the of the issue as, as well? I mean, what you've been telling us is absolutely horrifying, I think. I know we've had an issue in Beverly, but the wider context and if more people are aware, then more people will feed in. I don't. I don't know how we do that. Maybe your East Riding again is, is is um is is a good vehicle. Can look into that, can't we? Okay, everybody happy with that? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for everybody coming today. We've just got one little item to sort out at the end of the work program, haven't we, Liz? Um, you can stay if you like, or we're going to. It'll take us two minutes.
Literally will be. Um, right, so we've got obviously item um, seven on the agenda. That's just a, a, a copy of your, your items that you've heard this year um, in the work programme. Um, and item eight is your new work programme that you put together um, at your work programme setting meeting. So um, the change, to, there is a slight change um, in that a homicide fire and rescue service um, can't make the 10th of October, that, but I have offered the 6th of March. So there is, we've swapped those topics um, uh, in that there's a topic to be confirmed on the 10th of October. Um, so if you want to keep that one just sort of free for now, I'm sure there'll be something that crops up or there might be a change when once I start sending these out externally. Um, so really it's for you to just Hopefully you've had a look at the scopes. If there's anything you want to add, let me know. Um, this is then going to overview management for them to confirm. Okay. Okay. And then the last one, obviously there's no items to add to the full plan of key decisions. That's it. That's Peter. Thank you. Okay. Thank